The views and opinions expressed by tonight's guest and topic of discussion do not necessarily represent the official policy or position of Spaced Out Radio, Spaced Out Saturdays or Sundays, SOR Media, its hosts, syndicated carriers, or anyone associated with this broadcast. Any rebroadcast, reproduction, or other use of this broadcast or podcast without the expressed written consent of SOR Media is strictly prohibited. Listener discretion is advised. Are you experienced? Then come own the night with us. Brother has taken control, shoveling dirt in every hole. Predators to condemn your soul, watching you and watching me. We're all Station atop the mountains of British Columbia, live from SOR headquarters. This is Spaced Out Radio with host Dave Scott. Like nothing's wrong Soon you will be long You can follow us on our website spacedoutradio.com and on Spaced Out Radio on iTunes You can follow Dave on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram at Dave Scott S-O-R on Facebook at Spaced Out Radio Show and on our YouTube channel, Spaced Out Radio. Brother wants to make headlines, be immortalized. Everyone's got an electric eye with the digital spies. Buckle up, space travelers. It's time to go for a ride on Spaced Out Radio with host Dave Scott. I know you're out there. It's Wednesday, April 25th, Thursday, April 26th, if you're on the East Coast or across the pond. And this, my friends, is Spaced Out Radio. Hope you had a great day and night. I am your host, Dave Scott, live from the Great White North in the Caribou region on top of the mountains of central British Columbia, right here at SOR headquarters. We are 150,000 strong nightly on the SOR radio network, WQEE 99 Rock the Key in Noonan, Georgia. We're live as well on the United Public Radio Network, 107.7 FM in New Orleans, and over 160 countries around the world. We're live at spacedoutradio.com. Spreaker, don't forget to listen to us on The Fringe FM. Go to thefringe.fm to tune on in. We're also on Periscope every Monday through Friday night, starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern. You can watch me on TV, much like one of our brand new viewers. You know who you are. Oh, yes. You know who you are. I'm excited. I'm excited. Francie Idol, good to see you. Thank you for tuning us in. You get the special one today because you're brand new. Anyhow, our YouTube channel, Spaced Out Radio. Go to YouTube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio to connect live with us during the show. Really would appreciate that if you don't mind. You can go to our website, spacedoutradio.com. we got a plethora of features there for you. Rock out to some Bumblefoot. Shop at our Spaced Out Radio store. Read the encounter online. My blog is on there. Or watch great videos from UFO Seekers, Contact TV, and so much more. Good to have you with us, everyone, tonight. One of my favorite guests is coming up. But first, got to tell you, 
it's a little dry around here. You know, we had like six feet of snow this year. Six feet. Not yes, it melted on down. Yes, it melted on down. Okay, but you got to realize it is dry here. It is so dry. It is like Ray Romano, not funny type dry. Okay, that's how dry it is around here. And I got to tell you, man, I'm going to pick up my son today from daycare for preschool. Okay, and I'm driving up the highway, going into town. It's about 10 minutes away, going up the hill, and there's fire trucks on the other side. Giant grass fire already. Some idiot probably threw a cigarette butt over the embankment and lit it on up. But that's dry. That's really dry. So be careful out there. Don't If you're a smoker... Don't go throwing your cigarettes out. I don't need to burn this year. I don't want to be evacuated from my house. This is starting way too early, way too many bad memories. But that's okay. We're not going to ruin it for tonight because a familiar voice returns to us for the first time since last year. Author and movie executive Ian Holt joins us to talk everything paranormal, strange, and odd when it comes to movies, books, music, or just everyday life. With Ian, we never know where this is going to go. It's just the way he likes it. Growing up in New York, Ian first saw fame while hanging out with his best friends who went on to form the famous rap group Public Enemy. Ian found fame on his own when he received permission to co-write the sequel to Bram Stoker's Dracula. He's also currently putting together a movie with Mickey Rourke as well. He's a man of many talents. He was one of the first shock jocks in radio in New York after Howard Stern. He also spent time working on MTV raps. You remember when MTV actually played music? Instead of reality TV, I like them because we share the same birthday. Which Ian will come on the air and celebrate with me on May 24th. We started that tradition one year ago. My good friend Ian Holt, always a pleasure to have you back on Spaced Out Radio. How you been doing, my friend? How you doing, Dave Scott? How you doing, Spaced Out Radio fans? Oh, it's good to have you back. Can you believe it? I know. I know. Yeah, I haven't spoken to you since, pretty, it seems like since last year. I know it seems strange, my friend. It totally seems strange that I haven't had you on in so long. And I was looking at my schedule, and I said, you know what? Something isn't right. I was looking at my schedule last month, and I'm like, something isn't right. And then I finally put it together. Dude, you know, I'm going to take full blame for this, and I'm going to tell you why. Since the beginning of the year, I have had people coming up to me. When can I come on your show? When can I come on your show? And literally I've overbooked myself. Like right now we are booked straight through to July 9th. I've never been this booked wow. ahead. Never been this booked ahead. It's crazy. Well, I, you can use me as the hole plugger. You know, when you get a hole and someone drops out, drop me in. Well, I, I, I like to, I like to. You know, you're one of those guys that we could do that with, totally do that with. So it's something that we will try and do a little bit more. So I owe you an apology for that, bud. I really do. Oh, please. It's, it, it, this, is, this, is, this is the uh, day we wait for. This is the fun we're going to have. So we get to catch up on everything. I get to hook up with all the, all the fans out there. So it's great. Whenever it happens, it's good. And besides, now I've got more stuff to talk about. Yeah, you've been working your butt off here. You know, and let's get it. We're going to get into that in a little bit here. But if you hear the dogs barking up, upstairs, that's because Mrs. Spaced Out Radio decided to come home right at showtime. So my dogs, and I, and I got I got three big dogs now. I inherited Mike Morin's dog. And and he, uh, I, so I got a big German shepherd now to come on in and, and uh, help me out with guarding the family. Beautiful, beautiful black German Shepherd. But, Ian, there's a lot of people out there who may be hearing about you for the first time. Tell them a little bit about your resume, how you got to where you are. Um, I don't even know where to start. I mean, I, I, you know, it, someone asked me this the other day, how'd you get started? And I was like, I don't remember. <laughs> Actually, I think I think what happened was I... Um, well, anyway, I, I, guess it's, I guess it's my life really took off after... Uh, I met Dr. Dre. That's when it really took off. A buddy of mine at uh, NYU, um, I had just gotten back from Romania. I was researching doing um, a historical Dracula, a, a movie about it. And 
I had written a vampire script first that got around Hollywood. Didn't get bought, but people got interested in me. I got a manager. Before I know it, this friend that works for Dr. Dre says they're doing Who's the Man. And then the Universal's hiring them with Joe Dante, who's going to redo all the Abbott Costello movies. And they were doing, um, they were doing uh, Buck Privates. And then they needed someone for the second movie, which is Abbott Costello meets Frankenstein. And uh, they didn't have an idea of how to do it. So they got to understand, I freaking love heavy metal. Like, my favorite band is... Me too. Like, Van Halen, Judas Priest, I mean, you know, Iron Maiden. So I hated Yo! MTV raps. Hated it. <laughs> I was like, where's my Ricky Rack with it? Taking my headbanger's ball off the air, putting those two knuckleheads, Dr. Dre and Ed Lover, and, and Team Money. It's like, what the hell? But then I, you know, I met someone. I was like, "Oh yeah, well, if they need me to write a movie, I'll write a movie for them. I don't care, even though I hate rap music and all that, right?" So I wind up going to meet Dre, and he says, "What's your idea?" I said, "Dr. Dre and I'd love to meet Blackula." <laughs> he cracked up, and I was on a plane to L.A. with him to go meet Joe Dante, who did, you know, The Howling and Gremlins, you know, and we put a deal together, and uh, and then. Who's the man opened on the day of the Rodney King riots? There ain't no money, and Universal dropped the Abbott Costello movies. And Drace felt so bad because this was like my big shot. He put me to work for him at MTV, UMTV Raps. And, uh, you know, they're best friends with Public Enemy, and that's how this whole thing started. In fact, Joe with the cat out of the bag about the big birthday show, who's going to be on? Well, you know what? I'm very much looking forward, man, to seeing what all your projects are. You're one of those exciting guys who has your hands kind of dipping in everything. And, you know, you have kind of really, since the first time we chatted, you and I just clicked. It's to the point now where, you know, I'm going to show everybody on Periscope. I have zero notes prepared for Ian because the way we've decided to do the show is just say screw it and just go with what the audience wants us to talk about and and talk about a few topics that we we just normally do because it's just an all over the place conversation some of you will be like what the hell is this all about others are you are going to say this was one of the greatest interviews I've ever heard because it's so relaxed and chill <laughs> like we're sitting in the middle of a bar watching the game having a couple of drinks that's just the way it goes my friend but you know I got to ask you, you know, for our audience members who are new and may not know you, we and where our audience is always, you know, evolving, you really came to us because we got in hold of you the first time, which was just over a year ago now, a year and a half ago now, about Bram Stoker's Dracula. And we were talking Dracula. How did that book come about for you? Um... Well, uh, when I came back from Romania and, this, and I saw it for Dre, um, I, I had experience the first time I was in Romania. Um, well, first, before I get into that, there's something I have to do, otherwise I'm going to be in trouble. And you've got to help me with this. Okay. And then I'll get right back to the story. I'm good. But there's someone out there listening for the first time today, right? There's a friend of mine who challenged me and said, you know, she still had, well, this is a friend of mine from junior high school and high school. And she said, I usually go to bed around one thirty, two o'clock in the morning. You know, she's still like still on her curfew, you know? <laughs> and, uh, she said, I don't know if you can keep me up until three. So that's a challenge first off. And then the other one is, you know, when you know someone from junior high and high school, you know, you, you, you can't screw with them because they know where all the skeletons are buried. So I want to do a big shout out to a friend of mine that goes way back, uh, Pamela Nardone, who that's her married name, but I know her and we knew each other back in the day, Pam Salmagi. So Pam, I hope you're listening. Hi, and I hope you could stay up till 3 a.m. Okay, keep well, me interested. Let's, if I let's, win, let's keep her on, interested. the first drink's on you. Yeah, and if she goes to sleep, then uh, I I got to buy the first round next time. I see you. Well, so, how, how do we know yeah. if how do we know if she's actually going to be not falling asleep? She just may want the free booze and and you know say, oh no, I I fell asleep after hour number two. Well, I was just so tired. Okay, Pam, if you're if you're listening, if you're up, you gotta you gotta um, 
let's see, how are we going to do this? So you have to text me, or you know, message me at 3 a.m. <laughs> You're still up. <laughs> and then we'll know. Because I trust her. I trust her. I have to trust her. She knows where I'm like. When you're, when you're a known person and you run into people from your past, it's like your greatest fear to piss them off. Because, like, can you imagine if we, growing up now, and did all the stuff we did? Can you imagine if there were, like, pictures and records on Facebook of all of that? <laughs> See, it's lucky we grew up before Facebook. So... Now, I guess I can go back to uh, the Dracula. Well, it, it, it's very funny because um, I was watching, um, I was watching uh, this Bravo show. You know, I, got, I finished college, and I was partying all the time with my fraternity brothers. I didn't know what to do with my life. I didn't know how to get started. You know, I saw this Bravo show, making of Bram Stoker's Dracula with, um, with Francis Ford Coppola, and he held up this book called In Search of Dracula, which was a bestseller in 1973. So I ran and quit my job as a bartender over at Speaks, or I think it was Club California then. And um, I uh, took all my money <laughs> and I ran to Boston where they were teaching. And I said, please give me the rights to your book. And, you know, everyone had a screenplay. Everyone at school had a screenplay, you know. And I just said, you know what? Everyone's written the next, you know, great screenplay. But if I have the rights to a bestseller, then I have something, a proven commodity, a branded product that no one else has. And um, they gave me the rights, you know, for a dollar. And I said I'd split the screenplay with them if I sold it. And that's why I went out to Romania to research, you know, the actual Dracula, the historical Dracula. I wanted to do like this big Spartacus epic, right? And uh, when I got back, all that happened with Dre, and I got on Yo! TV Raps and was doing the Fat and Outrageous Comedy Tour, and we started doing the morning show on Hot 97. And in the midst of all of that, uh, I was invited to uh, Dracula 97, which was by the professors who'd written the book, um, I, I, which was the um, 100th anniversary of the release of Bram Stoker's novel. And while I was there, I met some people in the Stoker family, and I got this idea of what if I brought, could bring Stoker back to Dracula and, and get Brahms, Bram Stoker's estate to officially recognize my novel as, <laughs> that I was, would write as the official sequel. And everyone goes, you can't do that. They've been trying that for 100 years. The Stokers don't want to, you know. But then I met Dacre Stoker, who... Uh, who I convinced that he could reestablish copyright by which Brom had lost. And I think in the, you know, when they were doing the, the right after the first movie, the Bela Lugosi movie, they lost copyright. So they haven't made any money on it since 19, like 31 or something. So, um, it was run to really shady circumstances, but I convinced him to reestablish a copyright by writing a sequel. And that's what we did. And it sold for the biggest first time author pie in history um, I mean, we beat out Stephanie Meyer, <laughs> show from Twilight, and um, it became an international bestseller. You know, and I already done a movie at this time called Dr. Chopper. So after that, everyone's like, oh, what movie do you want to do? And Bleeberg made a deal with me to do episode 50, and then I started my own company. And now we just finished Death Metal, which is going to, which was just accepted tonight. Now, this, now, Death Metal is a whole new deal for me because I'm going without, like, I'm going the festival route, all the film festivals. I've never done that before. So I figured let's try that instead of, because usually I, I do distribution, set up distribution before the movie's made. But this time we're going totally, you know, by the seam of our pants. So uh, Gen Con in Indiana is going to uh, be the first uh, place we screen the festival cut. And uh, that's going to be in August. And, um, in July, we begin shooting um, Unhinged, which was with Mickey Rourke, Costas Vandalore, uh, and um, I can't announce who the female is because we haven't agreed on a price for her yet. So, <laughs> but this is a well-known female actress. Um, she's got a lot of horror cred, and we start shooting that in Youngstown, Ohio, I, I believe, in July. And then after that, uh, I got the documentary that we announced about Public Enemy's early days. Um, 
called uh, When Reagan Killed Roosevelt. And it's about, you know, um, how they started out as a, as, a, uh, as a DJ crew called Spectrum City. And um, and then there's going to be some big news going to be announced at the end of the summer that I can't but I, I can't talk about yet. But uh, you know what it is. I told you. <laughs> Sorry, buddy. I know nothing. And then uh, I know nothing. Right. But that's going to be huge because I'm going back to the studio system that I swore I'd never go back to. <laughs> so, and it's not a horror movie, believe it or not. Sorry, everyone. <laughs> But I'm going to do some outside horror for a change. I know? can't. Be- and, I can't um, believe you're getting invited to all of these, you know, movie uh, festivals. I-, I see you as the kind of guy walking in with the tweed jacket and the necktie that is, you know, like just bu- just above the belly button. That's what I see happening. <laughs> no, 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 no. I mean, I. Sh- me and Mickey share the same tailor, Giorgio Armani. <laughs> we don't go anywhere if we're not. There's tweed Armani. there. There's tweed there somewhere, my friend. Tweed on Armani? No, only Mickey would wear his um, wear his cow- straw cowboy hat. You know, he wears that cowboy the cowboy hat he wore in um, in uh, if you've seen the last episode of a uh, series finale of uh, Dice on Showtime, or if you've seen. Uh, the first Expendables, that raggedy, dirty, filthy cowboy hat he freaking wears everywhere, Mickey Rourke. It feels good. It feels good. Yeah. So, sounds like you're yeah, having well, a lot you know, of fun. He's playing a psychiatrist. We had to put in the contract to make sure that Mickey doesn't wear that hat. He wore, he Why? Be... <laughs> What's wrong with that hat? Wear the hat? Dude. <laughs> That's his. That's his signature calling. I mean, yeah, he's got gray hair, great, great hair. Uh, <laughs> you you don't know what went on this week. You well, the past like month, you don't know what's been going on. I mean, all right, Costas meets a couple in Los Angeles. Costas Bangalore started my first movie, Doctor Chopper. He's been all the screen, uh, the uh, Saw movies. He played Detective Hoffman. He was on the last ship last year. He was the uh, the uh, commander of uh, the uh, Greek Navy, which he loved because he's Greek. <laughs> um, so Costas met this couple, pregnant, and they had this little Pomeranian. You know, Mickey loves little dogs. He's got a bunch of little dogs, chihuahuas. And uh, the couple wound up becoming friends with Costas. They went for dinner and they got friendly and then the woman had some complications. She had to go into the hospital and she was going to need bed rest and the husband wasn't going to be, she wasn't going to be able to take care of the dog. So Costas gets a little worried and, um, he, uh, he, he calls Mickey and says, look, Mickey, can, do you know anyone that would take this Pomeranian? And, uh, Mickey goes on Instagram about the Pomeranian and gets like a thousand people to call him and he finds some MMA fighter that he knows <laughs> and that loves dogs and has this ranch out in Arizona and he's got like a kennel. So he said, calls back Costas. He says, I found someone for the dog and Costas calls the couple and the dog, they gave it to someone nearby who could take care of the dog. And Mickey says, that's it. I'm calling. I'm getting a, a private detective because I've got to go find this dog and make sure the dog's all right. It's not even his dog. So Costas, now he's mad at Costas because he didn't, you know, Costas didn't give him the dog to take care of. <laughs> so I've been trying to find the person, help them find the person who took the dog because Mickey wants to know, make sure the dog is safe. Might as well and ship, this is like, ship him up to my house, man. Ship him. I got three. I what, know, what's but, another dog? Uh, but yeah, but I mean, it's like you've got these three guys who all they're doing is looking for a dog. The MMA fighter, who I can't name, Mickey and Casas. And the hell with their careers, the hell with anything. They've got to make sure the Pomeranian's all right. <laughs> so that's, that's why we don't actually have a start date. Because... Mickey can't think of anything else but this Pomeranian. So S- send it to my house. I'll uh, yes. I'll adopt it. Send it to my house. Get <laughs> that movie he's, started, he's, man. He's, Just tell Mickey to well, cover the sometime food. Sometime in July. Don't, yeah, t- sometime t- in July. 
Tell Mickey to cover the food. That dog can come to my house. Hey, I got a story to tell you from earlier on, but first, I I just got an email because I'm always doing something as the show goes on here. And a brand new fan of ours named Gabrielle sent me this email. She goes, Hi, Gabrielle. She goes, I just want to drop a note to tell you how much I enjoy your show. I download and play it through Stitcher. For many years, I was a faithful coast-to-coast listener, but I have to say that most of the shows have gotten really boring to me. Saturday night, sometimes okay, and when George Knapp uh, goes on Sunday, it is good. Otherwise, I'm just not very interested anymore. Once I found your show, I found what I was looking for. Your accent cracks me up. Take care and thank you. What accent do I have? Ian has an accent. Ian has an accent. You can, I can't hear my accent. You can hear my accent. I can hear your accent. You can't hear yours. It's just, that's the way it is. I, d- I don't think I have an accent, man. Do I have an accent? Oh, my God. You belong in Strange Brew. You belong on, like, SCTV. Oh, come on. I mean, come it's like, on. You know, it's like... What it, I mean, it's, yeah, come absolutely. It's you know, a you know, uh, a you know all that. You got the Canadian accent, totally, <laughs> totally. Oh, by Just the like way, I, I got this Brooklyn, Long Island, New York the kind of thing going on. You know what I'm talking about? We don't know Forget what the hell you. We don't know what the hell your accent <laughs> is, my friend. You know, <laughs> all I know is that everywhere Ian goes, it comes with a couple of hot dogs and a New York Yankees yeah, flag to wave. Oh, did you yeah. see the game tonight? It was like Fog Central. I, I didn't see I it. Any of you, I don't know if any of you out there love the horror movie The Fog by John Carpenter, but I swear, if you were watching the Yankee game tonight at Yankee Stadium, they were playing Minnesota, they won, yes. Now they're in sec- time for second place. But the fog was so thick, it was like the fog rolling into Antonio Bay in the, in the horror movie. It was unbelievable. Well, I don't know how we went off on that tangent, but I did get horror in, see? We're getting closer to the main subject of the show. All all right. Well, John T. at hashtag Spaced Out Radio says, come on, Dave, give us a take off, you hoser. There you go. There's a good Canadian accent. Take off, you hoser. It's not... (laughs) And you're a hockey fan? Come on. Oh, man. You're a walking Canadian cliché. This is true. And, and I'm not going to lie today. I was wearing my toque today. There you go. Yeah, wearing the toque. Beanie for you American people. Beanie for you guys. But uh, anyways, Gabrielle, thank you so much for your email. I wanted to share it with the audience. I'm, I'm really happy that we were able to earn your listening ears. That, that truly means a lot. And, and, you know, the other thing I wanted to mention is so I, I told you earlier in the audience earlier that I was driving to pick up my son today from school and we had we had that fire in the grass. So I gotta tell you this story, this paranormal story, my friend. This is pretty, pretty damn cool. So earlier today, a member of my team, and I'm gonna start announcing, you know, some members that maybe you don't know, Amy Martin from Amy on the Radio is joining Spaced Out Radio behind the scenes to help us with the business aspect of the show. And her and I were in an in-depth conversation, and I had my dogs outside letting them go to the bathroom before I had to go and pick up my son. So I bring the dogs in, and I come to walk into the studio so I could start logging things off on the computers. And my door to the studio from where I'm broadcasting right now is about 25 feet away. I open the door to the studio, and upstairs from my kitchen or living room, I hear my son kind of go, woo-woo, or something like, like, you know, one of those little happy, screechy sounds that kids make. And I just froze, and I went all goosebumps. And I said, oh, my God, Amy. I just had the strangest experience. I said, that was weird. She goes, what was weird? And I'm like, I I don't know. I just heard this sound. She's like, what did you hear? I said, Amy, I heard my son upstairs. And I said, my son isn't here. And she goes, oh, my God, I heard it too. And I said, did it sound like, woo, woo, woo? 
two or something along those lines. And she goes, holy crap. But she swore. And she goes, Dave, she goes, I don't know what that was, but it drowned out your sound. And I heard it clear as day. And so she goes, are you sure your son isn't home? And I'm like, no, he's in town at preschool. He's like 10 minute drive away. And she goes, you better go upstairs and check that maybe Mrs. SOR didn't bring him home. So I go upstairs, I start calling him. I'm like, and I call my son Bubsy. I say, hey, Bubsy, where are you? Are you around? Are you here? Silence, of course. The dogs are looking at me strange. Even one of the cats is looking at me strange. Go into his bedroom. Nobody there. Nothing. Nothing's moving. The house is silent. Absolutely silent. Go uh, go into his room. Look out the front window to check to see if Mrs. S.O.R. was home. No, of course not. So, literally... It was a strange paranormal child experience today in the SOR headquarters. Very strange, dude. Well, you know, it it sounds to me when, for those of you who are are just joining the party, you know, I've done a lot of ghost hunting. Um, You know, I've, I've worked with the guys from ghost hunters and all of that. And, and, and I've, you know, when I researched episode 50, which is a ghost story, you know, we went to uh, West Virginia State Penitentiary, which is like one of the most haunted places. We spent the night there. We spent the night at the uh, Trans Allegheny Lunatic Asylum. And we've we've done a lot of research. I've had experiences through my life, weird stuff. My mom too. You know, was like that. But I I can definitely say, you know, with the, both of you hearing it like that, imitating your son. I I think that's a poltergeist. You know, that's and for those of you who don't know, there are different classifications of hauntings. There's the um the non intelligent, which is basically something that plays in a loop. You know, like if you see something walk across the room and then a lady you'll see it walk across the room again. And then there's intelligent haunt which interacts with you. And then there's the poltergeist, which is like a trickster spirit, usually up to no good. And then there's an inhuman. Now, an inhuman, people don't call it different things. You may call it a demon, if you, you know, if you believe in that. You know, it's clear what your religion is. A jinn, you know, it's different nature, but something that was never human. And they are the most evil types of hauntings, like you saw in The Exorcist or Possession. But the poltergeist, a poltergeist imitating your son's voice, trying to call you or get you to come somewhere that is something that was brought in. You know, like when I was a kid, you know, my mom, gave, my, my grandma gave me a Ouija board. And, you know, you know that that, that started stuff for me. And, you know, Jason Muse helped me, you know, figure out why these things were kept happening to me because I never closed the door. So, you know, you brought something in. And that's, you know, Someone somewhere did something to bring this in. I mean, did you get a new piece of furniture from an antique store? Did did Amy play with a Ouija board? Was she, you know, uh, outside at a uh, Native American religious site? You know, there something happened because that thing is calling you. It's trying to imitate your son to bring you there to show you something to do something and it's not all usually it's not good i mean poltergeist are the ghosts that give scratches like if you've seen people that have um red marks on their hand after an interaction with a ghost they'll the ones that will you know are the usually the frightening ones because they'll move stuff when something moves like you know we were at the uh shannon's allegheny lunatic asylum this wound up in the movie uh, cause it really happened. There were like nine dead bees lined up on a windowsill and I ran out of the room and I grabbed my, my manager and I said, Amy, you got to come in and check this out. And we came back in and they were all lined up there and no one else had gone into the room. And we came back two were askew, like two dead bees. Who was going to move Ted bees? There was no one else. There was no draft. It was just, you know, they'd moved. So that's the sign of, you know, intelligent hauntings usually don't move things. 
they'll interact with you, but they won't move things. So it's, 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 you got to be careful, my friend. Well, you know what? I had a few months ago, because we were having, my stepdaughter was having some issues, all right? And I actually had one of uh, Eric Cooper's team members, astral team members from Forest Moon Paranormal, come check out my house, and they do pretty good work. And I will never forget him saying, when he called me the next day to tell me how it went, he goes, Dave... He goes, I have to tell you, from the astral realm, your house is like a Kmart blue light special for the paranormal. He goes, you got Bigfoot in the backyard, you got aliens all over the place, and let me, don't even get me started on all the, all the fairy folk and ghosts that are walking around your property, including the fire elemental that wouldn't let me inside your house. Well, then you have to explain to people where you are. You know, it's like just saying that makes it sound like, Oh, yeah, sure. But if you explain, like, the terrain around you, they'd understand that. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, you're in a wooded area. You know, you're, um, you're outside, you know, the big cities. So, you know, um, you are in, like, the main, like, Bigfoot country. By the way, I'm sorry to just jump this in, but you know... In I think it's May. Uh, what is that? Uh, May something. For uh, first Sunday in May is the last Bigfoot ep- finding Bigfoot episode. About time. Uh, it's going to be on uh, Animal Planet. It's a special two hours. They're going to have like a retrospective, and then the show, and then a goodbye episode. It's going to be like all night. So it's it's during their uh, Monster Week on Animal Planet, which is pretty unbelievable. You know, it's pretty unbelievable they're ending that show, you know, and it's like, I think people, you know, they, I mean, they should be having this show on until they find something. They've been finding constant evidence, but I guess they haven't produced a Bigfoot yet, so I guess they're canceling it. I don't know. And it's still, the ratings are supposedly good. But you live right in that, you know, it's, I think it's the 50th anniversary of the Robert Patterson Gimli footage or whatever it is of, of famous pictures of Bigfoot, a film of Bigfoot, they were able to get it redigitized. It's supposed to be the, the biggest, the best version of it. And they find new things on it that prove that it's real. And, uh, they, uh, they're going to present this evidence. that probably their best evidence on the study, which would probably make you crazy. Cause you know, you're in Bigfoot central there, right? If you take the Pacific Northwest up, I mean, it's right where you are. So, I mean, for them, there's no there's no borders of of uh, of countries. They just move through. <laughs> well, unless you know, I mean, it's just lucky that the Bigfoot are on the southern border because then we'd have you know Donald Trump hunting him or something. <laughs> well, you know what? Better than Justin Trudeau asking them to vote. You know, so you're not in good shape down there. I'm definitely not good in shape up here. You know, North America's screwed right now. Let's just be honest. North America. But also, you have water sources, running water sources, limestone up there, which is, you know, what it it creates electromagnetic fields, which is like attracts ghost activity. Well, where we are right now is you always hear these stories about UFOs and and ghosts and everything around volcanic activity. Where we live is That's lit- true too. we like twenty five minute drive from me is a dormant volcano that has been dead for about a million years. So we got like it doesn't matter where you are in this area. There is pumice rock absolutely everywhere. Absolutely everywhere. So it is kind of cool. I mean, I mean, I, I, I mean, you know, it's it, it's scary. But you you go into a volcano like at Santorini, off the coast of you know near Greece, where supposedly you know there was this volcanic eruption which supposedly sank Atlantis. But the, there was an actual island there that got blown up in this giant eruption about over three thousand years ago. But when you go down in there. I mean, I, you know, the, the water is beautiful, crystal clear, and the whole, it's a caldera. It's, and the, the city is on the side of the volcano mountain that goes right into the ice blue water. And like, you come out on your terrace balcony and you look out over the balcony, 
and you can't see anything below. It's like you're floating on air because it's on an angle, the whole town. And when you, you got to walk through switchbacks, you know, but when you go in that water, the volcanic activity, I mean, you swear you see things. I mean, you see things like shadows of people and stuff. I don't know if, uh, you know, if people watch TV, but there was just a, a movie the other day where they showed someone alive. Oh, it was the, the terror. The guy was under the boat and he was trying to fix the, the, the propeller and he saw something floating in the water. It looked like a person. I, I, it, it's all the time in Santorini. People always talk about it. Those are the, supposedly the ghosts of Atlantis. So actually they called it Aquatiri, the city that they, they found. It's like a, it's like a, uh, a Pompeii. It was buried under the ash at Vesuvius. Well, this was also buried under the ash. They called it Aquatiri, but it, you know, more and more people think it's Atlantis because it's like a round caldera, and Atlantis was a round island, you know, with with uh, these round waterways inside, and it had a port and the whole thing, just like almost like you know, described in the Greek histories. So it's it's uh, volcanoes can draw this stuff. And, you know, for all you out there, really, who say, okay, we're a little, we're a little crazy. I mean, all you have to do is read the science. And I tell people this all the time. You don't have to believe that it's a ghost. You don't have to believe it's a demon. You don't have to believe it's Bigfoot. You don't have to believe whatever. There's explanations for these things. Bigfoot could just be an undiscovered animal. Some kind of, you know, uh, ape-like I mean, you know, we did have Gigantopithecus, which was a giant man-like ape. We found that skull. We thought they died out 10,000 years ago. We might be wrong, you know. Um, we, we, you know we find, uh, you know, uh, the coelacant, which we thought was this prehistoric fish that died. Now let's find out it's still alive. So why can't it be a Bigfoot? You know, you, you say, I don't believe in ghosts. Yet now they're finding out you can store data in electromagnetic fields. Well, if you can store data in an electromagnetic field, that's basically a ghost, right? It's a spirit. It could be your soul, whatever it is. If our brains are basically flesh computers and work the same way as a computer, and you know you have a, a field of energy inside you, when you die, that energy is released. How, how do you know it can't take your you know, your data with you. Those are your memories. So you could call that a spirit or you can call it, you know, uh, electromagnetic data field. I mean, you could call it either one, but it's been proven now in science. So, you know, that's why, that's where the faith comes in. You know, is it a soul or is it, you know, some electromagnetic data field that floats up into an Akashic record? You know, because everything in space is recycled. So your memories, your energy, whatever it is, would be recycled, and then you have reincarnation. You know, whether you call it reincarnation as a spiritual thing, or it's uh, a scientific process, but more and more we're finding out that these scientific res- that these sci- there's a scientific explanation or uh, a correlation between science and, you know, whatever religion you believe in. Well, you know, it's it's something when it comes to the paranormal and the strange and weird, Ian, it is something that I love the feeling when it happens. I had a, I po- quickly posted that story on Facebook. Amy came on to tell us what it was all about and her side of the story on there. We've got a ton of of people kind of checking it out, saying, "Wow, this this is kind of cool," and, and giving their theories and. One of our listeners, Kat, who lives in Edmonton, great, great person. She's like, well, are you are you going to investigate in your own home? And I'm like, no. I'm at the point now, Ian, where I've had so much happen to me that when it doesn't happen, I get a little anxious and rambunctious. You know what I'm saying? Like, I love it when it happens because I always try to think, okay, why did that happen to me? Why does this continue on? You know, so I really do not have, you know, 
the the want or desire to actually do an investigation. And I know that sounds weird, and probably people think, well, if he really did have that happen, he probably should do a, an investigation if he's a paranormal type guy. No, it gets to the point where it's just like, oh, wow, that was awesome. That was fantastic. There's, there's a point that you reach when you're doing these things, investigating these things, where you're convinced. And you don't need to do any more research. You're convinced. And that comes with, you know, why you're doing it. You know, for me, I, I mean, you know, the producer I work, I think I've told this story. The producer I work with passed away. My aunt passed away, you know, and I just come back from making my first movie, you know, and, and these things were on my mind. Like, you know, where are they? What are they? You know, where are my friends? You know, where's my friend? Where's my aunt? And then my uncle passed away shortly after. And I, I was dealing with all these losses, you know, as, you know, I, I started to put together, um, uh, the episode 50 where we started researching, you know, and when I went to the trans Allegheny lunatic asylum, now, for those of you who don't know, trans Allegheny is the most haunted spot in the U S supposedly. And, um, it used to be a, a psychiatric hospital then it was a Civil War hospital, then it was a Civil War prison, and then it became a psychiatric hospital again. And, um, oh, it, it was also, uh, um, uh, what do you call it, sanitarium for people with tuberculosis, or what they called it then, consumption. So, um, what, for those of you who don't know, I mean, this is how sick we are as a society. Um, in the 1800s, a man can marry a woman, have a child with that woman. And then let's say he gets tired of her and meets another woman. Well, since the woman can't own property, all, the, all her wealth, all her things, when, it, when, her, when their parents die, passes through her to her husband or to the county. She can't own property. So now the husband owns all the family's property. Let's say he meets, now he's got some money that he controls and he marries another woman. All he has to do is say his wife is insane. There's no trial. There's no doctor. And they, he can have the, the wife and the children committed to an insane asylum. Even if the children are, have no mental problem, just get rid of the wife and the children. He gets a divorce and he gets to marry again. So it's, it's pretty sick. So a lot of men would, would take their wives and say they're insane and they would get committed to trans Allegheny, which was in West Virginia or is in West Virginia, I should say. So while we're there, you know, um, we have electromagnetic field sensors and we have all, you know, everything going and the owner of the place says, you know, you should try, you know, copper divining rods. Now the idea with divining rods is, um, if you hold a blue ceiling in your hands, they'll cross when you enter an electromagnetic field and ghosts supposedly create electromagnetic fields. So, you know, we were doing our investigation of the place and I bumped into something that made it cross and I started asking questions and that's how you know you have an intelligent entity there because you could say to them, you know, step towards me and the rods will cross and I have the electromagnetic field detector on the ground and the, the light goes, goes from, you know, off to like green to yellow to red and it beeps, you know, and I got the, to back it up with secondary is the, um, divining rods. So I said, if the answer is yes, come towards me. If the answer is no, move away from me and the rods will part and the lights won't go on. And I'm explaining it to this. And I, I had a 25 minute conversation with this woman all through yes or no answer. She didn't like answer me in like, you know, sentences, I would say, you know, uh, uh, were you a patient here? Were you a patient here after the Civil War or before the Civil War? Were you here a patient before the Civil War? No. Were you answer? Were you a, no, nothing. Were you a patient here after the Civil War? Beep, 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 and the finding rods would cross. And we were able to pull out this whole story that she was committed there. The place they started bringing in tuberculosis patients. She and her child got tuberculosis. The son died, and she died shortly after him. But she didn't go into the light because she was looking for him. 
and she's still looking for him all this time. Obviously, this, the only thing I can think of is the sun went into the light, is, and she did. But the thing about that experience, which was witnessed by you know my manager, the, the director, husband and wife of episode fifty, the Smallies, you know, and it was you know the people that worked there, they were amazed, you know, and they'd seen some stuff, you know, and. I, the thing about it is once you have that experience after a bunch of other things to add on to that to my life, when you have that, all of a sudden you go, okay, there's life after death. Because there was something intelligent talking to me. So you know, for all you out there that have lost people, loved ones, and friends, you know, um, life somehow, consciousness goes on. Um, there's something to it because I had that conversation where something was answering me. It was every time I asked a question, there was a response. Either the rods and the lights would go out or come on or the rods would separate across. And this went on for like 25 minutes. It was not like, oh, it happened a couple of times. It happened over a dozen times to questions we asked and we were able to pull the story together. And we tried to tell her, you know, you've got to find the light and go towards it and you'll find your son. You know, we try to tell these things. We don't, you know, of course, I don't, this is the, I don't know there's a light, but, you know, that's what we believe. But no matter what, what you think, there's some kind of consciousness that continues after death. And that comforted me that I figured I, my chances are good. That I'd see my aunt, you know, my uncle and, you know, my mentor, Boyce Harmon again. You know, for those of you who don't know, Boyce did, um, uh, all the Shapiro Glickenhaus films like uh, McBain and uh, The Exterminator. You remember all uh, the, uh, with Klaus Kinski, The uh, Soldier, and Ken Wall, you know, uh, from uh, Wise Guy, if you guys are big 80s fans. But um, he, was the, he was the first producer I worked for. And um, uh, so he passed away suddenly, you know, heart attack. And it was all these deaths right away. It was really getting to me because I had never really dealt with death. I mean, the only one quote close to me was my grandmother when I was like 10 years old. You know, I think I was younger even, maybe eight. So anyway, so it was, it, this whole thing is that you, once you experience these things, you know, you know what's out there. You, you believe it. And new experiences have to investigate or go crazy because the answers that you thought you, you already have, you're convinced. We only got about three and a half minutes to go in our first hour tonight. This one is absolutely flying by as it always does with Ian Holt on Spaced Out Radio. Ian, when it comes to the paranormal, have you ever had any experiences with spirit children? I believe I have. I mean, there have been a, a lot of interesting experiences that happened when I was at um, the Dracula sites in Romania. Now, it's not just that it's Dracula, like the cast, Dracula's castle in Planari. It's Dracula's castle, but it's, um, it's a castle that was built on top of other castles. And it was always a, a last refuge, the, the palace of Togoviste. You know, families lived there and it was overthrown uh, numerous times. Battlefield. You know, when you walk through to Govishte, that's where Dracula placed the forest of the impaled. And you can hear children. Like, like when the wind blows through these ruins, you can hear children. And what you, what you, the room you find out that you're standing in is the banquet room. Now, what happened in the banquet room is really interesting because you hear the children laughing and sometimes you can hear screams and what Dracula this is Vlad the Impaler Dracula the historic real Dracula um, he was about to be attacked by the Muslim Turks so he needed money to raise an army so he decided he was going to invite the entire welfare state all the poor and the homeless and everything to his big banquet and he fed them and gave them wine and everything they could want. And he said to them, look, would, would you die for your country? And they all said, yes, yes. We would die for our country. We would go to fight. We would die. And he thanked them. And then he closed all the doors, poured oil in, and burned them all alive, men, women, and children. 
And by wiping out the welfare state, he created enough funds to create a standing army and with 40,000 men defeated a 300,000 man invasion force and created the country of Romania. Because then it was just a principality, Wallachia. And because it was, it was uh, Greek Orthodox, it wasn't recognized by the Catholic Church, which ruled everything. So, of uh, the Holy Roman Empire. So, I mean, when you go into that room, you know, and you're, you know, and you spend the night there and you're out in the middle of nowhere, you know, and you got a little fire burning and you, you, you know, you, you, someone tells you, oh, yeah, this is the banquet room. You just realize you lit a fire in a room where all these people, you know, 500 years ago died and you, you, you start hearing these screams, you know, and uh, you hear children. And those, those are the ones that hurt the most. And the truth is there are, you know, children turn out to be many of the lost spirits because it's believed that certain, that children don't know to go into the light. They, they don't, if they're young enough, they don't even know what death is. It hasn't been explained to them. So they don't know what happened to them. And that's usually when the situations where you get a, a uh, some kind of entity surviving. I, I, I hesitate to call them ghosts because that's our understanding of them. You know, in Asia, there's another understanding. Like, you know, I didn't realize that our ghosts are not Asian ghosts when I did episode 50. So, you know, a, a ghost in Asia is actually a curse. You know, it's like if the family doesn't bury their loved one properly. You know, then then the the the, go, the ghost hangs around, and it actually creates bad luck for the family. And the longer it's around and not buried properly, that's why these families are such in terror when an airline gets lost or something, and they're going crazy. Where's my fam- Where's the body? I mean, you know, are they gone? And it takes up even more urgency to find the the wreck and all the bodies than it does here. I mean, I remember there was a uh, ferry he, that went he, down. Ian, you hold that story, man. Yep. i got to step out for our first okay, break sorry, of the sorry. night. Paranormal author, the sequel of Dracula. Ian Holt, the author here. He's also in horror movies, radio, television, movies. We're going to get into it all coming up next on Spaced Out Radio right after the break. Ian's going the distance, as he always does. We'll be right back. Find your escape where time has no limits. It's about living today and cherishing the heritage of yesterday. A spirit of adventure for what is new with the nostalgia of the past. Your timepiece is a reflection of who you are. Life surrounded by beauty from the world around us to the soul within. Escapewatches.com There is no time like the present to enjoy your escape. Use promo code SMF2017 for your 20% discount today. The freedom to post what you want, when you want. That's the social media freedom you need. Social media freedom is the free app in your app store. No need to worry about going to jail or being shadow banned any longer. It's the freedom to say what you feel. The freedom to know Big Brother isn't watching. It's the way social media is supposed to be. Social media freedom. It's time to set yourself free. Download from your app store today. Coming September 28th to the 30th, it's our first annual Caribou Paracon, put on by Spaced Out Radio and the Canadian Society of Questers. Three days of paranormal, supernatural, and spiritual knowledge in the beautiful 108 Mile Ranch, British Columbia. Tickets are $150 Canadian for the event, being held at the Spruce Hills Resort and Spa. Come watch our featured speaker, Grant Cameron, along with Lorian Fenton, David Weatherly, Ross Allison, and more. The Caribou Paracon, celebrating everything paranormal. Hey, space travelers. It's Joe Roop, your host of Spaced Out Saturdays. Come join me as we explore the realms of the paranormal, the esoteric, and everything in between every Saturday night at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern. You know the truth is out there. Don't get caught sleepwalking. Come join Spaced Out Saturdays. That's every Saturday night, 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern, right here on SpacedOutRadio.com. Psychic Sundays, spiritual communication, ET contact, Sasquatch in your backyard. We will have it all on Cosmic Passport with me, Elizabeth Anglin. Each Sunday, starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern, at SpacedOutRadio.com. I will take you on a journey of enlightenment. The goal is learning from the soul on out. 
We'd love it if you joined our experience, Cosmic Passport, heard Sundays at spacedoutradio.com. 365 days a year, we're in the field, investigating UFO sightings, talking to alien abductees, and visiting secret military locations like Area 51. We're UFO Seekers, official partner of Spaced Out Radio. Follow our daily search for the truth at ufoseekers.com or like us on social media. Catch us on Spaced Out Radio every third Monday of the month as we discuss Area 51, UFOs, and more. And also, don't forget to subscribe to us on YouTube. It's paranormal news at its finest. Welcome to The Encounter. At spaceoutradio.com, The Encounter online is SOR's trusted news source for everything weird and strange going on around the world. This is news editor Eric Markham. Our team of journalists are scouring the planet for those strange stories that rarely make the mainstream. No fear-mongering or fake news here. Head over to spaceoutradio.com and encounter The Encounter. Heading to Vancouver and looking for some great nightlife? The Moose Vancouver is the place to be. Catch a game on one of the big screens or just come rock out to your favorite 80s and 90s hair bands. Great food starting at $6.95. The Moose Vancouver is open until 2 a.m. nightly. It's easy to find near the corner of Nelson and Granville. The Moose Vancouver is the official rocking bar of Spaced Out Radio. Want to learn more about aliens, cover-ups, conspiracies, cryptids, and the paranormal? All you have to do is tune in S4 as we take over the Spaced Out Radio night, starting at midnight Pacific, 3 a.m. Eastern, each and every Saturday night, right after Spaced Out Saturdays. Hi there, this is Eric Cooper from Forest Moon Paranormal. Join me, Corey Ruiz, and friends as we discuss the hot topics of the night. It's fun, entertaining, and as dark as the night. Find us at spacedoutradio.com. Are you interested in advertising on Spaced Out Radio? Head to our website at spacedoutradio.com and click on our advertising tab. There, you will find an assortment of ways you can get your product out there with us, from radio commercials to banners and social media. Have a product you like our hosts to endorse? We can do that too. Visit spacedoutradio.com for more details. Do you want to know what's really going on in your world? Do you have questions about who you can trust in the mainstream media? Then look no further than the Rebel Planet. Come get the straight answers right here at spacedoutradio.com. Join me, Jamie Sexton, creator of Rebel Planet News, as I fill you in on the stories behind the stories. All you truth seekers, be sure to tune in to Rebel Planet on spacedoutradio.com the third Thursday of every month. Visit purpleplates.com today. For over 40 years, the Purple Energy Plates have been delivering amazing results for their many customers. Inspired by the great genius Nikola Tesla, the harmony, healing, and energetic effects of the plates have proven over and over to be beneficial and often miraculous to thousands of customers. Check their site for daily specials and choose from their many energy products. You won't be sorry. Visit them today at purpleplates.com. Hey, this is Canadian Paranormal Investigator Mike Moore. The third Wednesday of every month, I'll be teaming up with Dave Scott to bring you Ghosts of the Great White North. Each month, we will bring on guests from across Canada to discuss their ghostly encounters. Canada is a paranormal hotbed with stories you've never heard, so we're going to bring them to you. So get comfy on your Chesterfield, grab a donut, and join us, eh? The views and opinions expressed by tonight's guest and topic of discussion do not necessarily represent the official policy or position of Spaced Out Radio, Spaced Out Weekend, Spaced Out Radio Limited, its hosts, syndicated carriers, or anyone associated with this broadcast. Would you like to connect with us? Head to spacedoutradio.com for all your latest show info. And hit us up on Twitter using the hashtag Spaced Out Radio. Now, back to Dave Scott and SOR. Something about Uncle Bob's voice introing me back into the show just puts a smile on my face. Hi, Bob. Hope you're doing well today, buddy. Tomorrow night on the program, we got David Weatherly coming in. We're going to get an update on Black Eyed Kids, Wood Knocks, 
all sorts of paranormal, cryptid, UFO stuff from David Weatherly, one of the best in the business. We get going at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern time at spacedoutradio.com. We want to welcome in everyone listening in on WQEE 99 Rock the Key in noon in Georgia. We are also live on the United Public Radio Network 107.7 FM in New Orleans and over 160 countries around the world. Good to have you with us. We are also live at spacedoutradio.com. Spreaker, and you can catch us live on the Fringe FM. Bill Cardwell has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club. Hydroxyphenyl pyruvate. Hydroxyphenyl pyruvate is your password. What it means, nobody really knows, but Bill sets the password each and every night right here on the Mighty SOR. Now, if you want to follow us on social media, you can do so on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, You can watch us live every Monday through Friday on Periscope.tv. We would appreciate you doing that. Or, if you're looking for our archives, go to our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Please hit the subscribe button. We would really appreciate that if you want to catch this show or any other show that we've done in the past few years. Our website if you haven't been there yet, spacedoutradio.com, where we have a plethora of features for you. You can rock out to some Bumblefoot, shop at our Spaced Out Radio store, read the encounter online, my latest blog is on there as well, or you can watch great videos from UFO Seekers, Contact TV, and so much more. Tonight, award-winning author Ian Holt is back with us, as it's always a fun, great time with the Beast from New York. Ian, welcome back. Hey, Dave. Hey, everyone. You know, I want to get, uh, you know, not to get too solemn here, but a lot of people know Bazooka Joe. He comes into our chat rooms on Periscope and Spreaker, sometimes in the SOR Space Travelers on Facebook. We went out Bigfoot hunting yesterday. I met his dad for the first time. We didn't find anything at our gifting site. There's still probably too much snow to kind of get around deep in the woods where we got it. But Bazooka Joe today lost his grandmother, his final grandparent that has gone up into the stars and skies and the heavens above. And God bless you, Bazooka Joe, you and your family. Lots of love to you. And apologize, Grandma was 95 years old. Uh, all the best to her and and my condolences to Joe and his family and, you know, all our, for all our thoughts and prayers. Absolutely. Speaking of thoughts and prayers, my friend, we lost a legend about 10, 11 days ago, 12 days ago, and Art Bell. You know, and we've, yeah. been, we've been talking a lot about Art Bell this past week because it was such a, a shock to all of us at 72 years old, the living legend passed away. You know, we know he had been suffering from COPD. We're still waiting to hear what the autopsy report says, and I know there's a lot of people kind of looking into that, wondering what's kind of gone on with everything. What did Art Bell mean to you? Well, I think he was the team laser. I think, you know, we all, you know, like when I came to radio, you know, I think we talked about this a few times. It was music. We didn't have satellite radio. We were just getting cable vision down, you know. Um, and you hear this, you hear this music and you hear this. And yet in your life, my life, I've had these experiences. I'm sure almost everyone's had something strange they wonder about happen. And you hear the UFO stories, and of course, we're children from the Close Encounters generation. So, you know, I remember when I went to see Close Encounters, I got the the, the program, and on the back of the program was join the, the Skywatchers Club. You sent in like a $5 or something, and you joined the club, and you would record what you see in the skies. So it was always you know, there in the childhood, because we grew up with Star Wars and all the stars and the space program. So it's all part of it. And then there was this guy, you know, who was doing something completely different, you know, and, um, you would hear about it. You couldn't always hear it, but people told you about it. You have friends and, you know, all of a sudden, you know, you hear this something completely different. You hear other people having experiences like you're having, they're investigating things that you're curious about, you know, all of a sudden there's, there's someplace else 
to go to wonder about the JFK assassination or whatever's going on in the, in, in the world. These, it all, all these conspiracy, you know, investigations and UFO, it all comes back to Art Bell. He created something. And, you know, some people look, some people have their problems because like Alex Jones, he calls it entertainment. He said it was entertainment, you know, um, but whatever it was, it was something new in radio. And being a person who, who did Air America for years with Rachel Maddow and you know and Chuck D and Dr. Dre, and then we did Power 105 and Hot 97, which was music radio, so we did political talk. I did this, and we even did some you know um, sports talk when we did uh, the ESPN morning show Cold Pizza with me and Dre. So I mean, you, you know, you you. I think it was ESPN two, by the way, not ESPN. It was ESPN two, but it was um, what you. What happens is you you realize you know how hard it is to bring something new and to get a following, and the fact that he had the vision to see it and and bring it. You know, would you would you have left sports talk? You know, I'd be mean, being a sports you know news person if it wasn't for Art Bell. You know, being the trailblazer, you know, would there even have been a spot for you? We would be here talking about this. And, and, you know, I think the evolution with online radio and, you know, podcast type formats, I do believe there would have been somebody to come in and numerous people to come in and talk about ghosts. But I do not believe for a second that it would have had any impact whatsoever it would have been more of a hobby farm of paranormal topics rather than the impact that art made because like you said he did it before the internet he was a pioneer he did everything the best quote that i have heard came from phil henry who said art bell did everything that the radio rule book told you not to do. And that included taking UFO and paranormal stories and experiences seriously. Well, yeah, that started, I believe it started with in church of with Leonard Nimoy on television. That's how it started for me. You know, I, I, I've seen these stories about things that, you know, a couple of things that had happened to me, you know, uh, unexplained things. Like I, yeah, I think I said this when I was a little kid, I was terrified because my, I lived in a place, it's Pam, if you're still up, you'll know this, the executive towers in, in Long Beach. And, um, there was a, there was a, a, a the doorbell would ring and then I go to the door, there'd be no one there. And we were far enough away from the stairs of the elevator that there's no way the person could run down the hall and disappear before I, I could get to the door and it would like ring and then we'd walk away and would ring and I would stay by the door. So that, you know, these kind of things were happening. And then you see about go and voodoo and, you know, I, I mean, all the stuff for the panel, Bigfoot, I learned it all from Leonard D. Moyes in search of. And then I think that interest spurred a lot of people to coast to coast. And then I think that that gave you a daily experience of what of what people were were, were experiencing. You know, people were interested in. Oh, that's something new. Uh, and you know that led to you know I don't think there would have been a, you know Ghost Hunters would have been the number one TV show in the country on Sci-Fi for years if it wasn't for Art Bell talking about it first. Where did the idea come from? Absolutely. And that, Ian, the question I want to ask you, though, is when it comes to the media genre, the entire broadcast perspective, and we can include online on that right now, there are not many pioneers that we can actually name. You know what I'm saying? Art was a pioneer. No, because, I mean, a pioneer by definition is something that's rare. I mean, if everyone could come up with something new, there wouldn't be pioneers. But I how, mean, and even how, within genres. Mm-hmm. But how impressive is that, Ian, that he was able to do that? Because 
that's not an easy feat, especially in the medium of radio, where everything has become over the last 25, 30 years so cliche around the dial? Well, I mean, I can't speak from from what he was thinking, but I can give you a perspective that Chuck D gave me and Keith Shockley from, from Public Enemy. Everyone was doing party music. You know, everyone, you know, uh, we, uh, you know uh, Sleep Till Brooklyn, um, you know, and uh, uh, hey, don't just, don't, just don't stand there and bust the moon. Or they were doing, you know, I can't live without my radio, right? And then Public Enemy was like, well, wait a second. You know, we're going to do political rap. Now, it's still rap music. So it's not creating a new genre. It's creating a new, you know, um, so he didn't recreate radio. But he started talking about something that meant something to him. So Public Enemy was about like, oh, I'm going to create political rap. No, they were experiencing, this is what the documentary will be about, is they're experiencing Reaganomics hitting Roosevelt Long Island. You know, the, and, you know, jobs disappearing. You know, uh, government, you know, funded, um, you know, after school programs, all this stuff, and summer programs disappearing, which led to kids, you know, gangs starting to form, drugs starting to form, people coming into this town, and the town being destroyed. That, that, anger at that seeing their town you know fall apart because of government policies get them to understand politics and it was a natural thing for them to do so taking it back to art bell you know you 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 take like you did you take something that you're interested in and you go for it like when i was in uh, you know i was in school i'm thinking of all this stuff because you know i spoke to pam earlier i think of high school and all that but you know, when I was in elementary school, even elementary, you know, I loved horror movies. I loved them. You know, I enjoyed them. I liked to, overcoming my fears. So when I was in art class, wherever we did, I would always, you know, on my book, when I was doodling, I would draw the Maniac poster. Or I would draw Freddy or uh, Jason or Michael, you know. And I'd have a red, one of those pens with all the different colors, and you press it. That if for a different color, I have red. Red would always run out first because I had the blood spraying and heads being chopped off. But not because, oh, like today, you probably would have been expelled for the most likely to blow up the school or something. But for me, it was story ideas. So it was a natural progression to start writing and making horror movies and enjoy scaring people. For art, I bet he has no idea he was creating something new. He was just doing what he felt naturally and then People followed. It was the same thing with Public Enemy. They didn't know they were creating something new. They were doing what they felt naturally. So for the uh, the creator, so when it comes to art, it's just having the courage to, do, to not copy someone else, to copy the latest trend, to do something different. You know, um, I mean, look at Black Panther, right? Everyone's talking about that movie. Why are they talking about it? Because it had a positive message in all black cats that made money around the world that they said couldn't couldn't do. Became the second most popular movie in, in US history. Beat Titanic. The only the only one ahead of it is Avatar. Right? But it wasn't your standard superhero movie. You know, it wasn't about saving the world. It was about succession and and uh you know, uh imperialism and you know, and, and geopolitics. I mean, you don't usually have superhero movies about this stuff. You know, if you watch the DC, oh, you got the big bad villain or the evil god that's coming to Earth. You got to use the special effects to shoot him and kill him. You know, and it's total fluff. Uh, you know, look at Get Out, right? Just a horror movie. But, you know, if there was ever a movie that puts you a white person watching, and I can't speak from a black perspective, but from a white perspective, putting a white person watching that movie to understand what it's like to to feel racism. And, you know, and, and, and that's what that movie did. It puts you in someone else's life, someone else's shoes. So there's constantly re- this constant reinvention. But I guarantee you, Jordan Peele, I mean, had some of those themes in mind when he wrote them. But he didn't realize he was going to reinvent the genre. He just wanted to make a really damn good horror movie. 
So with Art taking that chance, I mean, he was a political pundit. He was somebody who reported a lot on politics. But he noticed and he caught a trend with his audience that basically stated that his numbers spiked huge when he started talking about UFOs, ghosts, or conspiracies. That was led when he interviewed people like John Lear. A lot of radio hosts don't pay attention that much to the numbers. They just want to see what their monthly oh, numbers are. Yes, they do. <laughs> well, what, no, let, let me let me let me correct that. I for mean, when a, I was on radio, we lived for the numbers. Yes, you lived for the numbers, but you didn't. And I agree with you on that. And I, and I wanted to finish my sentence. You weren't for a lot of people registering the spikes. Do you know what I'm saying? Art noticed the spikes when he did paranormal type topics. Well, that's the thing. See. It's according where you are. If you're in a big market like New York, you cannot take a risk and talk about something. Like if we went off topic for a, for a minute or two to talk about a movie review or a sport, sporting event, that was great. But if you had an in-depth cons- discussion, no, you had regimented time slots. You had music beds. You had you know playlist music that had to be played, and you had to come in and out. You know, and you had this many seconds, and you had commercials to read because they paid you more when you read it when you listen to radio and so and it's a pre-recorded commercial the ad time costs less than when you have the djs read it so it's so regimented there's not much room for experiment you get to throw in it hey did you see uh this movie today and you're like oh yeah it was great you see id4 yeah yeah we went to the premiere with with uh, will it was a freaking great movie you got to check it out okay now you know we've got this music coming up and that's, you don't really have a chance. And you live and die by the, um, by the book and the, you know, the, the weekly, quarterly ratings. Because, <laughs> I mean, we were in a death spiral with, with Imus and, and, um, and, and, and Howard Stern. Mm-hmm. It was always mm-hmm. the three of us competing. Mm-hmm. So you don't get that chance. But he was outside the big city. You know, he was operating you know, in a place where it wasn't that contentious. And he was able, you know, to experiment. And that's sometimes a real luxury. Like, a lot of these great people, you know, they find their shows when they're, you know, out in the Midwest somewhere, you know. And then, you know, it's brought to New York or it's brought to the big market. You know, Mm -hmm. and, and that was a luxury before he got syndicated. He was on a smaller radio station. He was able to experiment. And... They will look, you know, he was looking for a way to move up. He was hungry. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, we use this slogan around here, we own the night. And if people knew what that actually meant, you have to check out our Spaced Out Radio poster. Because it's not about we as in me and all of us. It's the creatures of the night. But in reality... Art Bell owned the night. He owned it for a long time. You can say what you what you will about his personal life and his four wives and the kids he ignored. He didn't live a very good life off the radio. I thought Laura Brown owned the creatures of the night. I don't know. I don't know. You remember that song? I do we remember that song. Of, or do I, I just date myself? You kind of dated yourself there, but that was a good song. Yeah, I, I hate it when that happens. You know, I all of a sudden I got her confused with Patty Smythe because I was going to break down into the Warrior. <laughs> oh, Laura Brannigan, that, that was a great video. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, that was a great video. You can throw in a little Bonnie Tyler, Total Eclipse of the Heart, in that one too. Well, is she also holding out for a hero? I, you know, I have yeah. a thing. You know, look when I, when I was a kid. I I saw um, Rabbit and I fell in love with Marilyn Chambers. And I found out she was a porn star. Yes, you know, she has that raspy voice, you know. So now any woman with a raspy voice, I go nuts because as a kid I was nuts for Marilyn Chambers. So um, Bonnie Tyler, Stevie Nicks, forget about it. <laughs> I don't know about Stevie Nicks, man. You know I have to agree with South Park on that one. When I hear her saying it's like a goat. On a farm. Nah. It doesn't matter. She's got a rat nah. voice. It's just that she sounds like Marilyn Chambers. I love her. <laughs> yes. Comparing Stevie Nicks to a porn star. 
I don't know how you go there. But let's let's get back to well, our. She was a porn star to start with. She was a model and an actress, and the work dried up. Well, you, hey, I'm, I'm literally. <laughs> well, we won't go there. Oh my goodness! I can't believe it. Just I got to be nice. My ex girlfriend is a porn star, so I have to be nice. I know. I know. I understand that. You know. I want to get back to Art Bell, though, for a second, because we talked a, a couple of minutes ago about him being a real pioneer of this genre. Do you think the genre would be what it is today if it wasn't for him? W- where do you see this? No Art Bell, you know, not no coast to coast back in the day. Where do you see this field? I think the success of coast to coast got people looking, and there were people, you know, look, this all converged at the same time because when cablevision started and you had new stations popping up, they had to do cheap shows. So there was nothing cheaper than getting a bunch of people, you know, together and putting lights, you know, from a big, you know, light somewhere. And there's an alien ship, you know, and getting, putting people in shadowy, you know, stages and having them talk about, this stuff and the books they wrote about and you bring all these experts on and write these books who are probably inspired by in search of and, and, um, and, uh, coast to coast. And then they would write this stuff and then they would, these shows would come on. Now, why would you, why would you turn on the science channel or a and E in the beginning or the history channel? You put, you know, uh, to this day, ancient aliens is still one of the most popular shows on the history channel because you know, they did, you know, their, their whole uh, channel is now dedicated to, you know, aliens. You know, I mean, when on Sweep's time, you have on the travel channel, Josh Gates doing an extra three-part extraterrestrial hunt, you know, three weeks in a row. It's, it's three, three stories, right? So all this, it becomes successful, but one feeds the other. So Art Bell, you know, took it from radio. And then the success that he was having there, they brought those people that he was interviewing to start being on these cheap shows that they could do, you know, because they didn't, these little cable stations didn't have a budget. The only budget they had was for commercials. Remember the big channels back then, like AMC didn't even have commercials back then. You know, when I was supposed to you pay for cable, you didn't get commercials. So these little stations would pop up and they'd break break the promise and put commercials on. And that was their budget. They'd have like $250,000 an episode, you know, and you'd have to put together a whole show, a whole series. And they're still on today. I mean, if you walk around, those shows are still being repeated. Those old cable shows from way back when, but all that was from Art Bell. You know, he, it's called in the industry, it's called proof of concept. Or, or branding, you might hear it as in, you know, in, in business in general. But you have proof that this concept works. So let's try it. So it becomes viable now for people to invest money in another medium. And that's what Art Bell did. He showed that, it, mm-hmm. that it's a viable subject matter. And, and I think that there are two kinds of audiences. There's the audience that likes to watch it. And go, oh, come on, you're all crazy, you're all lunatics, you're all, you know, you know, uh, nuts. And then the other people that go, wow, something like that happened to me. Do you think it's real? What do you think? Mm-hmm. A lot of people will look at it and say, you know, the way he conducted his show, the professionalism and treating experiencers the way experiencers should be treated now he did call a spade a spade when somebody was trying to pull the wool over his eyes whether it was a guest whether it was a phone caller he was brilliant on the phones probably the best ever but do you feel that the way he was able to broadcast are you surprised let let me rephrase this are you surprised that with the popularity that he had in this genre upwards of 12 million listeners a night that other stations did not try to compete with that. They stayed with politics. Because they stayed they with afraid. music. Afraid of what? Because they figured, they're afraid that the audience wasn't big enough, that he had cornered an audience. You know, for a long time, no one would compete with ghost hunters. You had cryptic zoology shows like 
you know, Destination Truth with Gates. You'd have Ghost Hunters International. But there was no other ghost hunting show on television. And it was, I think it was six, seven seasons in before you had a competing show. Like, I think Ghost Adventures or whatever it was, the first one. But you had a different show. You know, but the ratings started to slip on, on, on Ghost Hunters. Because, like, you know, uh, you look at um, uh, uh, the adventures of Briscoe County, right? That show and X-Files started on the same night. They premiered on the same day. That was, you know, Briscoe County went down. But if you listen to the guys that did X-Files, they were inspired by Briscoe County, right? Bruce Campbell's show. And, you know, you'd think that Bruce Campbell from Evil Dead would have the bigger audience. It didn't. They came to watch his show and then stayed for the X-Files. And then the X-Files just took off because that was the show everyone was talking about. Did you see that? But, for the long, you know, there hasn't been a state of X-Files shows because they believe the horror audience, the paranormal and that's cryptozoology audience is limited that for the longest time, like the only certain amount of people could watch it. You know, if, if they took a major network and put it on, put on a ghost hunter show or a cryptozoology show or a UFO hunting show on like ABC, NBC or CBS docu style show, what would happen to the sci-fi channel, the discovery channel and all these other channels that pretty much make their living on this stuff? Like the discovery channel started with all of it. They diversified sci-fi channel diversified, but you know, because the more you, the newer channels brought, brought it up like, uh, like America channel, whatever the hell they call it. Um, I, you know, so they, they, because we're fringe. They always talk about us as fringe. You know, it's like, it's like, wait a second. Is having an open mind and not thinking everyone who's had an experience is a liar um, fringe? Gee, I hope not, because then we're not going to get very far in, in science and, and everything else, and, and, you know, in exploration and new inventions. You have to have an open mind. And I think that's what Art Bell, you know, was, was mostly sh presented on his show. Was Now, look, he called it entertainment. I keep saying that. So does Alex Jones call it entertainment. You know, now, Alex Jones has these outrageous theories that, you know, that the, the, the kids at, in, in Florida are, are, are at crisis actors. Or the, uh, the, the kids that were killed in Connecticut it didn't happen. It was a false flag thing. But you see, his success with the right wing audience, the far right audience, and the conspiracy audience con conflicts with us and our beliefs. And Art Bell, you know, was became that voice at the debarkation line. And what I'm afraid now will happen more and more is those lines that, between Alex Jones and us are going to be blurred because we're all being thrown in the same boat people with open minds, experiencers, and the people who want to make money on this. I'm thrown in with Alex Jones who's making money on conspiracy theories. And, you know, UFO now is a conspiracy theory. It's more about the conspiracy than it is that we're finding, you know, planets every day. They just launched a new satellite that's going to find more planets that are in the Goldilocks zone. What about that planet that they found that has a satellite, or they, what they believe is a satellite orbiting around it because it's not, it doesn't orbit it on a regular uh, uh, orbit. So it's not being moved by gravity. Something else is moving. So all these, you know, these, we're finding in science all this stuff, like I keep saying, but we keep getting thrown in like we're crazies, and we're not. I got a question I mean, for... You don't have to believe... Go ahead. Go ahead, yes. No, I was you, gonna say you don't have to believe us that we that we saw anything. They don't have to believe you that you ever had an experience. They just have to have an open mind that so many people had the experience of something there. Like I can't say what Bigfoot is, or I can't say there's a Loch Ness monster, but what I can say is something's happening there that people are seeing. You know, it could be you know, it's like somebody says, uh, some kind of 
volcanic vent down there that makes ripples in the water. People think it's a monster. I'll buy that, but something is ha- You can't deny that something is happening. And there's no such thing as a mass hallucination. Got a question from the audience for you. <laughs> Uh, we have a new follower on Spreaker named B. Arthur. So we're going to ask Maud this. <laughs> All right. We're going to ask Maud this. Maud wants to know what kind. <laughs> now you're dating yourself. <laughs> oh. You know, I remember, and I mean this no disrespect to anybody in any type of community, but I remember as a kid, I always thought B. Arthur was a man dressed up like a woman. I really did. I don't know why. I'm going to touch that. I am not going to no, touch no, that. No, no, and I mean, I don't, I don't mean that to be insulting, but, but it just, she scared me. <laughs> She scared me. Anyways, well, you know, you know why she got she got cast and how she was discovered. They wanted a woman who was going to be physically and verbally imposing to Archie Bunker. Remember, she was Edith's cousin. She did was not, supposed I did to not be. Know you know, that. Yes, her, her, Maud was Edith's cousin, and she was supposed to be the woman to take on like like. You had Jefferson, right? You know, uh, the Jeffersons to take on Archie. You needed a female to take on Archie. And you had the, the liberal lefty in Meathead and, and his daughter. And you had, then you had to have the woman because he was always picking on Edith. So you needed someone that was from the feminist side that was going to hit back. So her height and her voice and just her herself, he was a tough lady. And she was able to take, you know, put Archie in his place. He was afraid of her. And that was what made it so funny. And that's, and that's, normally I said, she's so good. Got to give her a show. And that's how it happened. <laughs> well, she was funny. Anyways, enough B. Arthur talk. <laughs> but I don't know why I find this so funny. Uh, but B wants to know, or Maud, whatever she is going by, what kind of effect, Ian, do you think Art Bell had on the horror film genre? I think... I, I think that people... people are, The problem with horror is people always deny it. I mean, horror films... They deny them as cheap little films because they make them for ten, five million to fifteen million to twenty-five million dollars, and most of them gross about fifty million, and then some gross, you know, one hundred and fifty, two hundred million, right? But they always think of them as like micro-budget, cheap movies. You know, they don't give any credit to unless it's a big studio budget with with Academy Award nominated actors or Academy Award winning actors. You know, like when, when George C. Scott did The Changeling or, you know, um, or you had uh, Ellen Burstyn in uh, in The Exorcist or uh, uh, Anthony Hopkins and, and Jodie Foster in in The Silence of the Lambs. You know, and or we have Mickey Rourke in Unhinged. You know, then they, they start to look at them seriously. And the thing about Art Bell, I think what it did was open up other stories. You see, like if you, like the, if you remember, you know, legend of Boggy Creek and uh, all this stuff, it, you know, you had Bigfoot and all that, but you start to see, you know, communion and other, you know, fire in the sky. And I think, you know, uh, Barney and, you know, the first, I uh, can't even name Barney and, um, which was, uh, Guy who played the guy was the voice of um, of Darth Vader. You know, he played the first band to be abducted. Um, you know, and and that oh, who was the villain in Conan the Barbarian? I, I can't think of his name now. I'm so upset. But um, he, uh, you know, it was the story of the first abduction. The TV series Project Blue Book, Close Encounters of the Third Kind. All of that, Dr. Robert Heinlein, you know, how did he get so big? All that came out of Art Bell. Because media, and especially Hollywood media, does not exist in a vacuum. You, Hollywood never creates anything. 
they take over stuff. They, if you show them that there's an audience and they can make money, sell it to that audience and make money on it, they'll do it. So I don't think Art Bell created horror, but he expanded the genre. Because then we have stuff like science fiction horror. Like if you, uh, right now, what's the number one movie in America? A Silent a Quiet Place, right? Absolutely. It's fantastic. I'm just going to say that. That's science fiction horror. Right. Right. I mean, that's Art Bell. You know, you didn't, you know, you had science fiction and you had horror, you know, and you got, you know, we think of the thing as science fiction is horror, but it started as science fiction. I mean, it was a science fiction movie. It wasn't horror until John Carpenter remade it. But those lines were crossed, you know, I, I think that grew out of, you know, Art, Art Bell and, and all of that. I mean, you know, I mean, look at this, look at the scene with Barry in Close Encounters, where the little blonde boy is taken and the mother's in the house trying to protect him. Even the toys moving, it's almost right out of the conjuring too. Right? Yes, I remember that all too well. Love that scene. Scared yeah, the hell out so, of I mean that Yeah, of course. I'm mean, as a kid too. I mean it scared the hell out of me. Those are the those those bring horror elements to sci fi and back and forth, you know, that's what I mean. We're all lumped together. You believe in ghosts. You believe in demons, you believe in exorcisms, and yet, you know, William Freakin came out with a new documentary last week. Uh, the, uh, what is it called? Uh, the Exorcism and uh, Father Amorous. Um, he films a real Catholic Church, Vatican ordained exorcism by a priest who is an exorcist, a real exorcist, the, Vatic the chief Vatican exorcist. I think with art, though, is he brought, as much as he probably influenced a lot of horror people, like you were saying, and I could see that totally happening, because, let's face it, when you own the night like art did, there's a lot of people listening to you and finding influence. They may be looking to take it that one step further in gore or whatever it is, but in the end, it all comes down to that spooky story that you only talked about during camping season, sitting around a fire. You that know what inspired it, you. It may not, you know, you, you hear a story on Art Bell, you know, about an alien abduction, you know, and it may not turn to be an alien abduction. It may turn into The Strangers, or a horror movie about people, home invasion. It might turn into Signs, right? You know, uh, with uh, uh, Shyamalan. But, or it might turn into Mr. Gl you know, uh, Unbreakable. You know, what's the real story behind superheroes? And you get this idea about, you know, genetics and genetic engineering and all this stuff because you were listening to, you know, Art Bell. I mean, it, you know, it doesn't have to be direct. I mean, you don't. Even, it could even be subconsciously. But when we listen to Art Bell, our subconscious started thinking about stories. You know, you, when you go from H.G. Wells to Art Bell to, you know, to whatever we have today. I think the influence on people, too, because Art was really the first one who came out, Ian, from a media standpoint. I'm not saying from a coast-to-coast -coast standpoint, but I'm saying from a media standpoint, he was really that first voice that told people who were being abducted by aliens or poltergeists or running into Bigfoot in the forest who said, I believe you, with a true, solid nature. You know what I'm saying? I thought that was he, phenomenal. Yes, but he didn't take the next step. And that's, you know, for those of us who are critics of Art Bell as well as fans, um, and I'm not sure I fit in that category, maybe a little bit, his idea of saying this is entertainment, especially now in the, in the, you know, I guess in this time, day and age, we, you know, you have 
You have Alex Jones saying what he does is entertainment. So you have, and and now you have even Sean Hannity, who's not a journalist. Now he's entertainment. Not even, you know, uh, he says he's a enter- he does entertainment. What you're saying is because that's you know a lot of people accuse that of being fake news or spin or you know conservative spin. So you're not getting true accurate truth. And I think for us, this is about science, not about entertainment. We want to know what's out there. Where we, what's our place in the world? Because we look at our wars and our fighting amongst ourselves is like ridiculous. We are one planet. And that, you know, the, the, you know, there's, there's reports of how Eisenhower put this panel together. What would happen with the defense department? What would happen if aliens landed? And it's, you know, it's up to the defense department and the Pentagon to figure it out. And they said all governments would fall apart. I can see Countries that. Incontinent. Yeah, I can see that, Ian. I can totally see that with that. But do you think with Art, the fact that he had the ability, which is hard in radio and entertainment, to have people trust him and he trusted the voices that were coming on the air, for the most part. He didn't. I don't know if he trusted them. I what I but I because you can never know what's in someone's head and that. That's entertainment sticks in mind. You know, he was still trying to make money. He was trying to put on shows. But what he did was he treated them as with respect. And that's, you know, that's something that started with In Search Of. They were treated with respect. You know, if you watch shows like, you know, they would, like even the shows with uh, Fracker, what is his name? The, uh, uh, I think his name is Fracker, number one on Star Trek The Next Generation. He did these shows, Truth, uh, True or False, where he put on you know UFOs and asked the audience if it was true or false and tell them if it was true or false. That sounds like that was making fun of it. You know, let's have fun with it. No, I want to know if there's aliens out there. You know, I mean, look what happened with the Phoenix Lights. We, we have a million people see this these lights. The government says they're flares. And then they show flares, what flares look like. And then they're not flares. But everyone goes, oh, come on, they were flares. Art Bell was the guy who would listen. And, he, and so many people came forward that the governor, I mean, uh, the governor of the state, 10 years later, the uproar was so great that he had to admit that he saw them too and they were not flares. After would- he left off. I have actually reached out to former Governor Fife Symington, who doesn't have a very stellar political career, you know, on his resume. But I actually reached out from him, out to him, never heard back, because I would like to ask him point blank one question: Were you told to make a mockery of the sighting, even though you saw it? And you came out later on and said you saw it. Did you make a mockery of that press conference the next day because you were told to do that? That's the only question I really want to ask him. Yeah, or were you, you know, when a general comes and calls you and says it was flares, did you just accept it? Because it's a general and you respect the, you know, the military. I think at you know, that le- I think at that level of government, my friend, I don't think it, it's a general saying that. I think it's a a general or somebody up higher up in the Pentagon or the DOD coming out and saying, yeah. this is what you're going to say. This is what you're going to do." I don't think he acted alone on that, even though at this time in his life and his political career, which went down the tube, you know having himself having to remake things. I think he's coming out saving face saying, I did see it. It's so similar to Roswell, you know, almost like Roswell in reverse, you know, it's so similar because I mean, there were people saying there was structure to it. They saw windows, they saw a triangle thing. The lights were connected. The lights didn't fall in the sky. They were moving, you know, and, and you go in a triangular pattern. 
and then they tell you it's flares, and, and then they have pictures of flares, and flares drop in the sky, and they spin around, and you could see the lights that's coming out of, you know, it's it's sparkler. It's like when you have, you know, a sparkler, it looks completely different a flare. You know, and you can't say that what that was up there. I can't say it's an alien ship. I don't know. And remember, UFO, I, I, I try to tell people this all the time and I start laughing if I say, oh, that's a UFO. UFO just means that it's unidentified. It's a flying object that we don't know what it is. Now, if you got, we don't know what was in the skies over Phoenix. No one's saying aliens. No one in their right mind can say aliens because it could be, you know, it could be uh, us, some new ship that we created from Area 51 or wherever in the world. You know, we're going to find out later it's a stealth bomber, you know, a uh, nuclear stealth bomber that can fly forever. Who knows? Anti-gravity. I mean, even there are even plans in the Nazis were working with anti trying to find anti-gravity ships. You can, with centrifugal force and, you know, and, and magnets, you can create anti-gravity. So we don't know what we're working on. But the, 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 the truth is, it, you know, they say alien to make us sound crazy. Then they find planets, right, out there that are in the habitable zone. And they, they thought planets were rare. Every freaking star, and there's a billion stars out there, every freaking star in our galaxy has, almost every single one of them has planets. There are billions upon billions upon billions of planets out there. And they said, oh, not many are in the habitable zone, what they call it, the Goldilocks zone? Well, there, but all that, remember, all these things that they, that they would say isn't true, we didn't always hear it before the internet, you know, and all this. You had to go looking for this stuff. Where did you go look for it? Where did you hear this stuff? Where was your mind changed? It was Art Bell, coast to coast. You got to hear scientists talk about the real science of it. Do you believe that? Where do you think Dan Aykroyd got Ghostbusters from? Well, Dan also had a lifetime of experiences, including with his father, who was a member of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. And his grandfather was very involved in something to do with this field as well, or an experience or something along those lines. Yes, but, I mean, that science in Ghostbusters came from was based on real science. The stuff, a lot of the stuff they talk about isn't just gibberish. He says it really fast. He says it in a funny way, but it is scientific theories in there that he's talking about. Do you, you know, and nobody took that. I mean, if you look at House on Haunted Hill and those early 50s haunted house movies with the ghosts with the sheets and all that, they didn't explain it, what it was. You know, that was one of my biggest problems with episode 50. They only wanted to buy it after I did the novel. Because I was like, oh, yeah, whatever he's doing, we got to get. But they wanted me to cut the science. They wanted it just to be evil ghosts, you know. And I'm like, no, I want people to understand what these things they're seeing are. And ask the question, if, we, if you see this, then what does it mean? And that's what our bell was. He didn't just say, okay, we've seen these things. It was also about what does it mean? Well, if you see a ghost, right, does that mean there's life after death? Is that proof of a soul? And is that proof of God and religion? I think you're looking into it a little too in depth because the majority of the paranormal population is not going out there to figure out whether or not there's life after death. They'll even tell you that if but, you ask them. Yeah, but that's fine. But just the existence of a ghost, you have to breach that subject. That's the science of it. You know, you have to say to yourself, if you see a ghost, then what is it? If that ghost is intelligent and interacts with you, what is it? Whatever, whatever you want to call it, thinking about it, discussing it in rational terms, now, like, oh, my God, I saw a ghost. I was so scared. I went under my bed. Or, you know, uh, you're an idiot. You, you, you didn't see that. You were drunk. What, were you, what shit were you smoking? You know, I mean, the, the, the decision to sit down and discuss it with rational thought and come 
you know, and, and try to figure it out. That's Art Bell and, and In Search Of, because uh, In Search Of treated the subject matter like real investigations, scientific investigations. And that opened the door to Coast to Coast, which opened the door to everything else. Art Bell, you know, made it okay to ask serious questions. Not, you, you don't have, there was a place to go where if you were curious about this, you could, you could go and get answers. You could listen to quest, smart questions. And believe me, a lot of those people that were listening started thinking, well, what if it's true that something happens to them and they pass it on, the audience grows, interest grows. That's why it's such a big industry today. But at the same time, we're still considered fringe because they don't know how big the audience is. And this is, you know, we always do this. You know, you have, you have movies that come out like, you know, if you wanted to do a movie with an all black cast and we, I, you know, I've worked with, with different people in Hollywood. We had different movies with it, you know, and they would say, Oh, it never sells overseas unless it's a comedy in France. And you got to have a fat guy, fat, fat black guy. That's what they like in France. I mean, I've actually heard that from executives. It won't sell in the rest of the, the world. You know, and, and then when NWA comes out straight out of Compton, it sells a hundred million in the U.S., but only 120 million in the U.S., only 40 million overseas. Then you have Get Out, which makes 200 million in the U.S. and you know not so great overseas. And then you wonder why, well, they're not advertising because they don't believe in it. Then you have Marvel, Black Panther comes out, it goes gangbusters overseas. Now everyone wants, everyone believes black movies can, make, black casts can make money overseas. Now nothing's changed in the population of the world. It's just that it's been proven that it's a viable market. And that's the way Hollywood is and media is with everything else. Art Bell proved this is a viable market. And until someone can take it and move it wider, you know, we're kind of stuck in this place where we're considered fringe. My friend, on that note, I'm, I'm going to get you to hold on okay. right there. We're, we're through two hours already. Unbelievable. Get out of here. Unbelievable. Two hours down, one hour to go with Mr. Ian Holt. Yes, the author, the movie director, the man with great hair who wears a tweed jacket and a short tie. <laughs> Ian Holt will be back with more. We're going to get to the thought of the Dave in hour number three as well. We'll be right back. Are you tired of being blocked, shadow banned, or placed in jail for simply posting your thoughts on social media? Social Media Freedom can take care of that for you. Social Media Freedom is the newest and one of the best free new apps that allows you the freedom to post what you want, when you want. It takes seconds to download from your app store. Come join the tribe at Social Media Freedom. It's time to set yourself free. The first annual Caribou Paracon is happening September 28th to 30th in the 108 Mile Ranch, British Columbia. Brought to you by the Canadian Society of Questers and Spaced Out Radio. Come listen to our featured speaker, Grant Cameron, along with Elizabeth Anglin, Paisley Town, Mike Morin, Eric Cooper, and more. It's a three-day supernatural adventure at the Spruce Hills Resort and Spa. Tickets for the weekend are $150 Canadian. The Caribou Paracon, celebrating everything paranormal. A timepiece is a reflection of who you are. And what better way to show off the real you than with an Escape watch? Escape is a lifestyle brand accessorizing your days and nights. Choose to escape and create the life of discovery that you deserve. Dream, play, unite with your own personalized Escape watch. Head to escapewatches.com. There is no time like the present to enjoy your escape. Use promo code SMF2017 for your 20% discount today. Looking for a place to advertise at a very reasonable cost? Look no further than Spaced Out Radio. SpacedOutRadio.com has an advertising tab that you can click to check out our daily, weekly, and monthly packages to play on the radio or our website, including social media. From commercial spots to banners, we have it all. Check out our competitive pricing today. To the dawn. 
We're lighting the void on Saturday nights on Spaced Out Radio. Hey, this is Joe Root, and I'm hanging out in SOR headquarters every Saturday night, bringing you the latest news when it comes to the weird and strange. Bigfoot, occult, UFOs, ghosts, and everything in between, I got you covered. You can tune in to spacedoutradio.com starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern time. Come travel into the void with us on Spaced Out Saturdays. Got ready for bed on Saturday night? Right after Space Out Saturdays, hop on over to S4 with Corey Ruiz and me, Eric Cooper from Forest Moon Paranormal. With S4, there are no limits to what we try and uncover. From government conspiracies to helping clean up the paranormal, no topic is safe on S4. We get to the heart of the matter, of the subjects you want to learn more about. So tune in on S4 starting at midnight Pacific, 3 a.m. Eastern, only on SpacedOutRadio.com. There's stories, then there's the truth. Do any of us really trust the news anymore? This is Jamie Sexton, owner of Rebel Planet News. The third Thursday of every month, I appear on spacedoutradio.com to bring you the truth you deserve without mainstream media lies or alternative media fear mongering. We'll get to the heart of the story and deliver the truth you're seeking. So come join us here for the Rebel Planet at spacedoutradio.com. The Call of the Wild is in Vancouver. The Moose Vancouver is one of the hottest bars and restaurants in the city. Open until 2 a.m. nightly, the Moose will rock you like a hurricane all night long. Great food with everything on the menu at $6.95. Near the corner of Nelson and Granville, get your horns up and come rock with us. The Moose Vancouver, the official rocking bar of Spaced Out Radio. Visit purpleplates.com today. For over 40 years, the Purple Energy Plates have been delivering amazing results for their many customers. Inspired by the great genius Nikola Tesla, the harmony, healing, and energetic effects of the plates have proven over and over to be beneficial and often miraculous to thousands of customers. Check their site for daily specials and choose from their many energy products. You won't be sorry. Visit them today at purpleplates.com. This is Eric Markham, news editor for the Spaced Out Radio's The Encounter Online. We have put together a great team of writers and journalists from all over the world to bring you top quality paranormal stories, from alien encounters to the latest conspiracies. You won't find any of that fake news here. True stories and top notch reporting as we look to bring these experiences to the mainstream. The Encounter Online, only at spacedoutradio.com. Do you want to know the truth? Do UFOs exist? Are aliens real? Are the governments hiding the biggest secret in history? We're UFO seekers, and we're on a hunt for the truth. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow along with us as we journey across the United States, visiting UFO hotspots and alien hotspots, trying to document the UFO phenomenon. Catch us on Spaced Out Radio every third Monday of the month as we discuss Area 51, UFOs, and more. And also, don't forget to subscribe to us on YouTube. You hear footsteps in the empty room above you. A rocking chair begins rocking by itself. Don't be afraid of the things that go bump in the night. Reach for Spirit Story Box. The iPhone app the Huffington Post UK called the only ghost hunting app you will ever need. Spirit Story Box. The spirits are telling their stories. It's Cosmic Sundays with me, Elizabeth Anglin, in Cosmic Passport. Let me take you down a three-hour spiritual journey where we will get into everything from ET contact to Psychic Sundays. It's a journey of listening and learning together with some of the best professionals in their fields. You can tune in to Cosmic Passport at spacedoutradio.com every Sunday starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern. The views and opinions expressed by tonight's guest and topic of discussion do not necessarily represent the official policy or position of Spaced Out Radio, Spaced Out Weekend, Spaced Out Radio Limited, its hosts, syndicated carriers, or anyone associated with this broadcast. You're listening to Spaced Out Radio with Dave Scott. Follow Dave on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and hashtag Spaced Out Radio. And on Facebook, Spaced Out Radio Show. 
Now, back to the program. Welcome back to the third and final hour of Space Out Radio tonight. I am your host, Dave Scott. Great to have you with us tomorrow night on the program. David Weatherly will be back. Yes, the Black Eyed Kids author. We're going to get into that. UFOs, aliens, ghosts, cryptids like Bigfoot. Whatever it takes, we're going to get into it tomorrow night starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern time at spacedoutradio.com. We want to welcome in everyone listening in on WQEE 99 Rock the Key down in Noonan, Georgia, home of the Walking Dead. We are live as well on the United Public Radio Network, 107.7 FM in New Orleans and over 160 countries around the world. We are also live at spacedoutradio.com, Spreaker, and you can also follow us on thefringe.com. FM. Bill Cardwell has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club. Hydroxyphenyl pyruvate. Hydroxyphenyl pyruvate is your password. Make sure you use it wisely, Space Travelers, as Bill sets a password each and every night right here on the mighty SOR. Now, if you want to follow us on social media, you can do so on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can watch us live, like right now, every Monday through Friday on Periscope.tv. You can also, also... Check out our archives. Go to our YouTube channel. Do me a favor. Subscribe to it. Our archives are free at youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. We would appreciate that so, so much. Our website, spacedoutradio.com, where we have a plethora of features for you. You can rock out to some Bumblefoot, shop at our Spaced Out Radio store, read up on the encounter online, or watch great videos from UFO Seekers, Contact TV, and so much more. We have Ian Holt with us tonight. He's the award-winning author who wrote the sequel to Bram Stoker's Dracula. He's involved in the music industry, the movie industry, television. He's got his hands in every media pocket. Ian, how you doing? Hey, we're back. I can't believe how fast this is going. Every time it gets faster, I think I think you're like a time lord. I don't know what it is, man. I can't believe we're through two, entering hour number three already. I want to move on from the Art Bell topic because we spent last hour talking about the power of Art Bell. But I got one right. more. Qu- I got one more question for you on it, Ian. And I think this is okay. the probably the most important one. I look at lo- uh, art, and I think a lot of broadcasters looked at art. And we've talked about him being a pioneer, but really sitting on top of, he created Mount Everest for nighttime radio. And usually, in if you use a sports analogy, there's always someone coming up who's the next best. Who's the best player in the game right now? Who is the best player in the world? You know, we see it in baseball, hockey, football, no matter what. I mean, you know, there was Joe Montana. Now you have Tom Brady type of situation. And I guess what I'm saying is, when I look at broadcasters today, and I'll even throw my hat, my name in that hat as well, I see Art being on the top of Mount Everest And, you know, we're 20 years in. Yes, Art just passed away, but we've seen a number of radio shows take over and different types of hosts, different people who've all tried their hand at this from blog talk radio to Spreaker to terrestrial radio. And it just seems like none of us are even close to comparable. Do you think that's a big, big issue heading forward in the paranormal field that that next voice that next set of perfection doesn't look like it's coming anytime soon well nobody's broken the mold yet and or or had that discovery see what's going to have to happen is again hollywood sees this as a niche audience and that audience is served by coast to coast and they don't see them opening a, you know, a, a satellite radio channel or putting them on, you know, a, a local radio station is going to bring enough ears to make it profitable. But someone, someone somewhere, it's going to be uh, somewhere, and it's coming soon because the science is catching up, Something's going to happen that's going to 
break that fourth wall and give some kind of concrete evidence on something that we're looking at. And that's going to change everything. And then it's going to open up because they'll want to test. Well, now, you know, this, everyone's talking about it. I mean, let's say we pick up, uh, you know, uh, SETI picks up a signal, a repeated signal. Everyone will be talking about life outside our solar system. You know, um, we let, we go back to the moon and we find that that what they say is a rock is actually a uh, a, a old uh, you know antenna, like they think it is. Well, there's some structures on the moon. I mean, everything changes. They land on Mars and they find pyramids on Mars. Everything's going to change. You know, um, the audience will widen. You know, um, or Someone's going to do something like some big giant celebrity is going to go on a show and say he believes he's had experiences. He was abducted. You know, um, I mean, but look what they did to Tom Cruise. I mean, he jumped on a TV show, jumped on a chair and said he loved the woman. All of a sudden, the guy's crazy. He said all these pills that kids are taking are going to mess with their minds in the future and they're all going to have problems. And now we're seeing those problems with these kids that have been on Ritalin and all this stuff. You know, Harvard does a study, you know, Matt Lauer, you know, make fun of him, doesn't apologize. You know, I mean, so, I mean, they can take apart anybody. Something's going to happen where it's going to be irrefutable. I mean, you know, on our birthday, we're going to hear a story about my friend who I loved his mom. She's a great lady. Um, you know, passed away, and he didn't believe, but he's been having experiences in his house. That's that's the guy in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, Keith Shockley. You know, I mean, these things as these happen, someone's gonna someone's gonna break a mold. And as far as the new voices, I don't know if there's any hope for radio anymore. You know, other than you, you know, who's gonna really come out and do it? It's, it's using radio as a stepping stone to create a TV show, which legitimizes it, which then reverts back to radio. Well, I mean, there is a number of people trying. There really is. I don't see that next phase out there. You know, I think we can all, there are many of us who can bring a good, solid game to the table, probably an A game or a high B plus if we put it on the report card. But to put in that A-plus perfection effort and get that every night, I think the biggest issue is with it is with the addition and advent of paranormal radio all over the place. I think the biggest failure that we have is that there is way too much out there. These, these topics have been whitewashed so much and broken down so much and individual shows created on specific topics that there is really nobody who is tuning in because it's the only show of the night anymore. They're going to where they feel comfortable, where their opinion matches the host, rather than trying to, how can I put this, trying to find that next talent and commit their time to it. You know what I'm saying? Well, but also radio is a limiting medium today. I mean, what got me hooked on, you know, uh, doing a vampire reality show that we did in Asia, you know, um, was, you know, and including Psy Vamps, was I'm watching this show about vampires. Someone used a FLIR camera. And the vampire comes to the room and sits down in the chair and you see the the heat leave the body of the victim, and the and the body and the vampire that's cold turn red and white, you know, and get hot. And all of a sudden, you you go, "Wow, that's real!" You can't have that experience on radio. You can describe it, but a lot of this stuff is visual. You know, what we have, you know, and radio is also limiting because the budgets are different. You can't go out and go to a haunted location with a bunch of people every night and hold a seance and, 
and do stuff, you're limited to people coming back and reporting in. That's why I think it's going to go to a visual medium first and then shoot back when it's been proven in a visual medium, then it will be able to be talked about more. I don't think, you know, unless someone comes up with a new way, uh, you know, it's like when they did ghost hunters, having, you know, the, remember they had the cameras in the rooms, right? But then you had Josh Gates who created that rig who were able to walk through the woods with a camera over their head that finding Bigfoot users and all them use. You know, we're right now on Gold Rush uh, Parker's Trail. It's a little tiny camera on their, sh- on their chest. They don't have to carry the big rig, you know. But, I mean, uh, there were innovations all the time to put you in the situation. I mean, you know, ghost, ghost hunters, there was a woman that had an urn, and the guy stood up and the camera was at his, at his side, and you see upside down the ghost stand up behind him, the shadow figure. You know, those, those accidents can't happen on radio. It's only someone can come on and tell you that it happened. And that makes it difficult. Let's move on to another topic here, if you don't mind. I want to get into UFO movies. You mentioned earlier Close Encounters of the Third Kind briefly. Are you surprised that Steven Spielberg never made a sequel or a remake of that? Considering the popularity and the multi-millions it made? Well, don't get the Blu-ray. There's like five different versions on it. He's never been happy with it. You know, he... um, First off, after he wrote the screenplay, he said he'd never write another one. Um, he hates it because, you know, the husband leaves his wife and kids, and he feels now that he has a wife and kids and has been through a divorce, you know, uh, earlier in his life, that he would never do that. And he realizes that it was a lie, that a, a, a real father who cares about his family would never do that you know, and run off with this other woman that he doesn't know who's also got a kid, you know, it, it just wouldn't happen. So, I mean, and, and the funny thing is when I watch it, it doesn't bother me because he's obsessed and he doesn't have sex with Melissa Dillon's character. So I, I'm Linda Dillon. So I don't, you know, Barry's mom. So I don't think, you know, they're on a quest to find something. He's obsessed. It's in his brain. He's not acting rationally. He's not himself. So I, you know, Spielberg, you know, I mean, especially if you see Ready Player One, you see that he's lost his, his childhood imp, whatever it was, that kept him as a child for so long. But um, I, I, I and sense of wonder and wow that was in his earlier films. But he really doesn't like Close Encounters. You know, I can honestly say, though, and I'll disagree with you and Spielberg on that. Not that my opinion really holds any water in the cup. But when you're an experiencer, you get so focused on what's happened, you do forget about the people around you. You do forget, you know, about your relationships, whether it's children or not, because you are so committed trying to figure out what happened to you. I think that part is because I always thought thought that part of the movie was a little weird, okay? The, the guy leaving his wife and taking off with another woman, okay? But when you when you have that close encounter or you've had ET contact and you're with someone who cannot understand what is going on, you back away from them completely. That's why you hear so many experiencers backing away from family, backing away from best friends, from. 20, 30 year relationships with friends or, or wives or whomever, because it, unless you have experienced that experience on your own, there is no way that you can, in any way, shape, or form, explain to someone or have someone who hasn't explained it or had that happen to them, okay, you can't convince them what you were going through. It becomes an obsession, Ian on trying to figure out what was going on. And I really liked that part. Well, also, you know, look at Yafit Koda. He was doing an interview about aliens, right? And uh, he mentioned that he's been abducted a few times over his life, and he was sent back to Earth to 
uh, you know, pass the word that aliens are out there and they're soon going to come and reveal themselves. And, you know, uh, people think he's weird anyway because he's an Ethiopian Hasidic Jew. Um, and, uh, you know, he's also a, you know, a uh, uh, activist for racial equality and civil justice. And he happens to have been abducted a few times. He just throws it out there, and all of a sudden he's senile. And they have to throw in, well, he's 74, you know. What does have to do with, what is 74 have to do with being senile? But that's I mean, my dad is, is 91 as sharp as a tack. Well, but this comes to the this comes to the next question. If if Spielberg has never been happy with the film, why not do a remake? Well, he wouldn't do a remake. The studio would. And who's going to make remake a Spielberg movie? Imagine the audacity of saying, I mean, making a Spielberg movie. They won't even. The whole plan was to uh, pass the torch to Mutt whatever his name was in Crystal Skull, Shia LaBeouf. But they realized no, one, no one's going to make a sequel to, uh, I mean, look what, how they screwed up the Star Wars movies. And we didn't even like George Lucas's last three, but they, they, you know, the, the prequels are freaking genius compared to the crap that they made in uh, the, the Last Jedi and uh, The Force Awakens. And they took the same story they what 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 is they, 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 you know Tatooine is now Jenna whatever the hell the planet it's Tatooine what are you talking about I mean it's just it's just ridiculous and, and you you have Terry Fisher Mark Hamill and Han Solo all alive and you don't put them in one scene together it's ridiculous the whole thing it's horrible. Uh, but when they come up with an original story like they did with Rogue One, all of a sudden, you know, it's one of the best. It competes against Empire for the best Star Wars. You know, I hope Han Solo is good. But do, who's going to compete with, with Spielberg while he's alive? Nobody. I can understand I that. Really, I can understand yeah. that. But, I mean, after 40 years you would think that there would be at least some sort of comparable movie because of that popularity. Well, there is. Not really. It's ID4. ID4. I think, I think Close Encounters and ID4, I mean, ID4 is silly, but as far as the bookends to the, you know, the good aliens to the bad aliens, you know, and then you have E.T., which is a lot like Close Encounters, the spaceships and everything else are very similar. You know, and today it would have been, oh, E.T. has got to exist in the same uh, cinematic universe as as uh, Close Encounters, so it could be a franchise. You know, <laughs> back in the in the seventies and the eighties, you know, you didn't, you didn't. Not every movie had to be a franchise. I just look at it, and I see from what I look at. How can I put this? Over the last twenty some years, Ian, we haven't seen a lot of P- e- positive ET contact movies. You know, for every for every one positive, we see about twenty to thirty negative. Well, do you realize we've never seen a UFO movie? In what regard? We've never seen a movie where someone's trying to find out what the unidentified flying object is. The unidentified flying object is always a flying saucer, it's always a spaceship, it's always alien. But that's the term UFO, though. That's what people No, coined. UFO is the, I, I know that's what, the, what people think. Exactly. I would do a movie just about a UFO. What is it? You know, imagine a guy... Who wants to find a UFO and he finds out it's a government program and then, then the you know, the big twist at the end is, oh, it's all, you know, reverse engineered for from Roswell. I mean, it, throw it in at the end. But I mean the real story is, you know, they're they're us. What are these UFOs we're seeing are us? We've never really seen a spaceship. 
We've never really seen an alien spaceship. What we're seeing is us reverse engineered, uh, you know, stuff. We don't know. I mean, Close Encounters is, is an iconic movie, but it it's not it's not like the it stood the test of time. You know, it's not it's not Star Wars. It's not you know it, it's not even Jaws. They still make shark movies all the time. You know, Spielberg never wanted to go back there, and nobody, you know, is going to, you know, sequelize that without him. I mean, George Lucas has stepped away from Indy so Spielberg can do his own final sequel and make up, because he blames Lucas for all of it. The, you know, the, the second one and, uh, and Crystal Skull, he blames on uh, Lucas. What about paranormal television? I think that's where, you know, we've discussed this problem. You know, um, paranormal TV has the same people on all the freaking time, all the time. You know, and it, you know, no one in paranormal television has expanded to like, you know, uh, create their own, uh, publishing label and then putting stuff out, you know, that's, or one publishing label become a genre division that creates all the stuff, you know, and puts it out in a big way. A lot of this stuff is self or, 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 or self, uh, um, published or small labels. Um, you have, and then, so you get the big names, you know, uh, and because, I mean, I don't want to say anything bad about Giorgio Tsoukalos, you know, but I mean, he's like the biggest name out there because of his hair and, you know, and all of that and, he come, you know, his pedigree, you know, because it comes, he's Von Daniken's protege, but he does nothing to expand it. You know, all his shows, all this stuff is just him traveling around. He never wants to bring someone on because he wants to soak up all those dollars. He wants to make a living. I don't deny him that. But, you know, or the producers don't want to let him, but he, he has to expand the field. I mean, Danik is, you know, an 80 already, and he's still on all the time, but he's not going to be around forever. And these guys, it's the same guys. Even when Cobbler's died, you know, his wife took over. Another copper. You know, it's like, give us one new name. Give us someone new. You know, I, I, I just, and I, I find, I find that it's the same people over and over again telling, and it's telling the same stories. The guys from MUFON over and over again. I mean, it's, it, it, it becomes repetitive. If you watch it's enough, you go to one channel. I mean, I, there are days where I could, Hear the uh, story about oh, what the hell is the uh, the the uh, English Roswell right on two different networks on two different shows? I can hear the same story told twice in the same day by the same people. Well, I can tell you this: I was coming to New York to see you this weekend. You know that. Until until the network that was wanting me to try out for the show decided to poo-poo that idea for nine of us who were trying and vying for three spots and going with this same crew. And the reason that I heard, you know, digging through the grapevine, because I always try and have someone in the know, is that A, these people are already under contract, and B even though they've said the same messages on two or three different programs and probably umpteen dozen documentaries, that they work in front of the public. The public agrees with them. You know, maybe not the message, but they like those people. But, I mean, at what well, point... Well, sure, they're on all on Ancient Aliens, and Ancient Aliens has the marketing power of History Channel behind it 
to make those people important. They send them out, they get them book deals because the, it drives eyeballs back to the, to the history channel. And when ancient, ancient aliens is on, the, you know, like right now, you know, ancient aliens has got a reason to come back. Like they keep talking about because they're finding new planets, a new space, a new, the new telescope is launching. And that whole thing about this satellite is supposedly on one of the planets that they found. Right. So they bring it back and all that and they promote it. So those guys, if you're going to do a show on A&E and you want to steal some of that big audience that History Channel has, you're going to grab those people. And what they forget to do is throw in a couple of new faces to build your own so you're not taking other people's, you know, uh, mouthpieces. I mean, when they want to know something, they call Eric Von Daniken at his, uh, you know, Chariots of the Gods, you know, uh, complex out there in the Netherlands. And he, he, if he can't do it, he calls, he tells you to get in touch with Tsoukalos. And Tsoukalos brings the usual, you know, the usual suspects. No, I fully understand and, why. I mean, there's millions of dollars at stake. Right, and you are scary to them. You're going to be scary for most for most of these shows because they try to put on a semblance of, I want to do research. I want the the like like uh, I want the people doing asking the questions to be researchers, not experiencers, because you're pre 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 positioned to believe. The only show that really has believers doing it are the ghost hunting shows. And the um, and the uh, and finding Bigfoot, and if you notice, almost every ghost hunting shows, they try to say they're not believers; they are investigators. So, what's missing in this type of programming? Is it the new faces? Is it that every show, no matter what the title is, it's all the same? Or is it a matter that maybe a lot of this needs to be flushed down the toilet because of the fact, Ian, that maybe the public is sick of seeing the same people with the same message, never finding anything, and we're seeing the run of paranormal reality television, paranormal covering all the bases here, starting to dwindle down? Well, I think you're running out of spaces to go to. I mean, everybody goes to, you know, Trans-Allegheny now. Everyone goes to Eastern State Penitentiary and West Virginia State Penitentiary. And, you know, you have the different asylums and stuff like that. I think, you know, uh, the more dangerous model is paranormal, what, what they were doing with Paranormal State. You know, th- that was a show where they were going to help people but they were going to help people that were dealing with inhumans. And if you watch these shows, you know, other than this new William Friedkin documentary, nobody's dealing with inhumans because they're dangerous. What happened to the to the lead guy on Paranormal State? Yes, but he was it, possessed, and he's in jail now because he got he you know, he was on heroin and all this stuff because he decided to do an exorcism outside the. Uh, Outside the the pre, priest told him not to do it because they, they he wasn't allowed to do it because they weren't going to do it on television, and he you know being a gay man had issues with the church, and the demon was able to weasel into his brain that way to mess with his thinking. You know he's a devout Catholic, his own you know self guilt from being Catholic and his issues with the church because of how they feel towards gays. Uh, uh, and he was hiding the fact that he was gay, and Sergey mm-hmm. was his boyfriend, right? You know, I was with him when we discovered the pentagram at the at the uh, at the at the um, West Virginia State Penitentiary in the in the Warden's house. I got pictures of it. That became a big part of episode fifty. You know, inspired it. But you know, the fact that you're saying his own family, his own family. Is, you know, he's asking for help. He wants an exorcism, and his own family say, oh, he's just a drug addict. Not that the drugs are trying to quell the demon that's, that's making him crazy and causing the addiction and all his bad 
every all the bad things that's happened to him and being broke and everything else, right? So you start doing, you start putting shows on the air, you know, where you know you take a medium, right, and you put her in a place that she's never been, that you know has a family there has had problems, and then she finds out about some kid or something that was killed a hundred years ago. And then you go to the hall of records and you find that kid exists. And if you can prove that that medium had never been to that place before and knew nothing about where you were taking her and maybe wore a hood while you took her there and had earphones on. So she, there was no way she could know. That's what the next phase is going to be. It's not about, you know, all these shows say it's about compiling evidence, but what do they do with the evidence they compile? Nothing. If you don't roar a conclusion, just seeing this stuff over and over again at the same places, when are you going to take this evidence like Josh Gates at the end of every investigation, going all the way back to the first episode of Destination Truth, takes his evidence to science, to people of science, tells them to, to evaluate it. Okay, but there's a there's a good example there. I like Josh Gates. I th- I would like to get him on the show. Maybe one day he will when we have time. All right, but he's now on his third or fourth different titled show, and it's the same show, different title every single time. The only thing that changes every now and again is a cameraman and one of the eye candy women that are usually on there. Well, you know, he's got two problems. He's got two problems with him. He's the most popular show on the Travel Channel. Destination Truth, he didn't own. Universal owned it. He was just the host. And then, you know, when he came to the Travel Channel and he he reinvented the show as Expedition Unknown, he wasn't only doing cryptids. He's doing, you know, lost treasures and all kinds of stuff. And he does like a travel log on it, too, to keep it travel channel the new one he doesn't even go to the places he just hosts it uh what, what's the name of the new one that's on on uh thursdays and then there's the repeats of destination truth but i mean all that stuff happened because he's the most popular show they want to keep throwing him out there you know and and that you know popularity you know then you become a tool i mean you know i could do whatever i wanted before i made the book you know, then, then when people were telling me what I'm supposed to do, that's why I made an episode 50 independently. You know, I'm not happy going back to the studios all the time, but I'm doing it because, you know, certain projects you have to have that kind of budget. You're not going to raise independently. So, I mean, you become a, a tool because what happens is then they want another movie. They want another machine. You know, they want another one. They throw money at it and all this, and you come up with an idea, you know, that you have for a bit. Like, you know, I do this to remake Metropolis, but, you know, got to get work there to get there because it would be hundreds of billions of dollars. You know, I mean, Josh Gates was the one guy on the air of all these ghost shows. I mean, it, it, you know, it's always on the ghost shows. It's always, we decide, no, do something with it. Start a crusade. Get the evidence to scientists who don't believe force them to give an explanation. You know, when Josh Gates brought back the freaking hair from the Yeti and it couldn't be classified it was an existing animal, that was huge on his last Yeti expedition. That's huge. But what's the next step? Who's the biggest, uh, you know, um, uh, expedition scientist researcher in Nepal from Harvard, from Yale. Who's that guy? Well, now take that evidence to him. Redo the DNA. Show me that this hair is of a species that's never been cataloged. Now what you're going to do? You're going to take your grant money and go up there with us and do an actual Harvard-backed, you know, peer-reviewed science of, of the Eddy? That's what we have to go with this. That's the point. We should be doing that. None of this is about solving anything. It's about ratings and getting people to listen and interested. Yeah, well, we've told all the stories. They're all the same. I see a ghost. You know, 
But is that ghost proof of a soul and proof of life after death? The one thing that scares everyone to death is death. That's why vampires are so popular in every generation. They don't age, they don't die. That's the thing that scares everybody. No one here gets out alive. But it's not so bad, you know, and you know it's the greatest loss of losing family, friends, and loved ones, right? But if you know there's life after death, you might see them again. Maybe the Bible's real. Maybe we'd be better people to each other if we thought it was real. It's not just, you know, an invisible man. It's not just based on faith. But hey, here's proof. Here's a burning bush. You know, the, I think the next phase is to actually start proving this shit or disproving it. I think... You know, they're supposed to... I, I think uh, we're, clo- uh, we're close to that, yeah. That's where we go. The show that does that... Like, why did big, Finding Bigfoot's ratings go through the freaking roof? roof? Because everybody was watching these... You know, Bobo was a little bit of a weirdo and all that, but they were watching these nerdy guys and girl, woman, you know, watching them every week waiting for the Bigfoot. Why did we sit there for six hours on Halloween, every minute of an investigation at at the uh, Stanley Hotel? Because chairs moved, tables flipped over, shit happened live. You know, and everyone was talking about it. The next year when they went back, it was the highest rated show in, the, in Sci-Fi Channel history, probably in cable history up to that point. 15 million people tuned in to Ghostbusters in a live investigation on Halloween. We saw it for ourselves. Now, what did they do with that footage? They say they're collecting evidence. And I, I challenged Jason on this. Uh, when he ha- it was, you know, they ended the show and they did nothing. Why did the... the They take the last episode, take all their best evidence, and take it to an investigator at Harvard. Disprove me this. I think you bring up a good point. You know, and I mean, you and I have talked, and I've mentioned on this show my opinion, and my opinion only, of paranormal groups like TAPS who... Their only goal is going into a place to tell whether or not it is haunted. I think that's that's very lame for the people who are inviting them into their homes or places of business because you don't know what they're doing to stir up or conjure the spirits even more, and then they bail on you. And, you know, with all the evidence they have collected, they damn well could have taken it to a scientist by now. There are many people who could have taken their evidence or feature. You know, the problem is a lot of these scientists who delve into this, they have other jobs and careers too, Ian. They have to be able to concentrate on their own work where they're doing this pretty much part-time or in their spare time. So there is that difficulty as well. Well, that's why you need to take that, whatever evidence you have and start influencing the scientific community. Like, I can't think of his name. The guy who does all the Bigfoot feet research, he's actually uh, a real scientist who looks at the feet of animals. And he looks at all those Bigfoot castings, and he tells which ones has the real arches, the real feet, the ones that are unexplainable. Now, that guy who's a real scientist who got interested in this because people brought casts of big feet that weren't just flat like impressions like we think, but have arches and ridges and all this stuff that would mean an actual foot that would allow for movement and walking. But we don't hear about that. Maybe if you watch, you know, Josh Gates when he does a Bigfoot episode, you'll get that. You know? But then what does he do with the evidence? What does he do? He has thousands of casts that he thinks are real. So what do you do now? <laughs> I mean, in science and technology, we've got to have something better than a bunch of guys going out into the woods making catcalls and banging on trees. There's got to be technology that we can create, you know, the advanced FLIR technology and things like that, that we can find these animals. What about a grid pattern? You know, there was once a movie with, uh, called Loch Ness with Ted Danson. And what, it, what that movie was is he got a line of boats 
with um with sonar and he went from one end of the lake Loch Ness to the other scanned the entire lake but he did it in one session so instead of having to cross back and forth he got a whole row of boats and that was the, the idea of the movie that was the plan of the movie that this one and the other and he caught saw nothing well then they found there were caves under there and it was hiding in the cave but the thing I'm saying is that's a really smart idea You've got two people up there that, you, that live up there that have a camera on the lake at all times. Put cameras all along the lake. Let's see. <laughs> I mean, not that I'm you know, that crazy about lock, whether the lock that sponsor exists or not. I mean, that's not my, really my cup of tea. But the idea is there are ways to do this to get real answers. Technology advanced that, you know, would be sponsored by big scientists with gr- research grants. And we don't do that. You know, we got about a minute here before we're going to start the thought of the day. If you want to have some fun with us, okay. Yes. No. Yes. Absolutely. Fun? All right. Oh, are you talking to me? Oh, I was. To I was. Guys, I'm always down. I'm always down for fun. Oh, absolutely. Even at three in the morning. <laughs> I know you are, my friend. I know you are. Thought of the day coming up right now. Thought of the day happens every night at this time, where during the day I ask a question on my Facebook page, transfers over to our Twitter account uh, at Spaced Out Radio, and we fire you a question. This one, totally dedicated to our main man, Ian Holt, tonight. Because we love Ian so, so much. The thought of the day of today is, who is the greatest horror movie character of all time and why? Ian, who's your favorite? I, I think it's uh, Frank Zito from... Joe Spinell's character, the maniac in Maniac. And I'll tell you why. Because I think um, what he wrote and why he wrote it, because it started out as a love story about a fat, you know, overweight, poor, blue-collar guy having a love affair with a beautiful woman. That, that's not his type. Because they shouldn't belong together. No one would make that movie. Even Sylvester Stallone, he got Sylvester, he got Sylvester Stallone the meaning that got Rocky made. Sylvester Stallone said, I can't make this movie. So in response to that, he wrote a movie about a guy who goes out and kills women. He made a movie about a guy who was abused as a child and turns that abuse and it's affected him, made him crazy. Um, and in that movie, he took a character and said, look at what the media says. If you're overweight, you don't have a right job, you don't dress the right way, you, you don't have, you have <clears> no <throat> greater face, you know, you'll, you're balding, right? All of a sudden, and the media is telling you got to have a woman that looks like this. She's got to be this, look this way. And if you don't have that, you're nothing. You know, it's all about surface. It's all shallow. And because he can't have that because of the way he looks, he rebels. And I think it was a brilliant indictment on our society and our shallowness, uh, how we see people, you know. And I think also it was a damn good, scary, gory horror movie. But the character, you know, by today's standards is everything we talk about today. You know, fat shaming and women. Right. Plus size models. And, you know, the imagery that we use to sell things and what's considered perfect, what kind of car you have, what kind of job you have. You go on social media, you know, you used to meet someone at a bar and used to be personal. Now social media, the first thing is what kind of job you have and and, uh, how much do you make per year? You know, uh, men, you know, uh, aren't meeting women. You know, if you you meet an overweight woman, oh, well, you know, my friends, you know, she's not going to be perfect, but I really like her, but she's overweight. And you start thinking you're not perfect because she doesn't look like what a cool man would look like. 
what a cool woman would look like for a man to have. She's got to be perfect, like she is in the movies, you know, or on the magazine right. covers. Yep. I mean, it delved into all of that. That's why it was such a brilliant film to me. Right on. Mine is Freddy Krueger. There's just something about the way Robert England played the character with that really wry, frank sense of humor that was just terrible punnage during the scenes of the movie. The way he killed, slashing, hacking, biting, the tongue. It was hilarious to me. I'm not a big horror movie guy. I would say number two for me would be Bruce the Shark from Jaws. And number three, <laughs> and three would be Pinhead. Let's get to some of our audience here, Ian, because I think you'll like some of these responses because I set this one up for you. Christoph on Twitter says, Michael Myers, old school suspense oh, yeah. seat of your pants horror with a modern but monstrous like the boogeyman touch. Over in the UK, Fascination Street says, I'm still a sucker for... Boris Karlov as Frankenstein's Monster Man. He was essentially a good guy, but demonized by a misunderstanding townsfolk. Disclosure Team says, Norman Bates from Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho. Kills his own mother, exhumes her body, mummifies, keeps it for ten years, while dressing up as her and in her character kills more people. Super psychotic and horrific character. That is for sure. The Pizza on Twitter says, Michael Myers, no need to get flashy, just pure evil. You know? Well, where, where's Lawrence Talbot? Well, we got more. We got more, man. Lots more. Come on, someone out there, tell me about Lawrence Talbot. That's my number two. Come on, Lawrence Talbot. Wendy says, Donald Trump, just look around. <laughs> I, I, I raised the stakes on her and I said, try Justin Trudeau. On for size. <laughs> well, I, I, Donald Trump is is actually too scary, man. <laughs> That's the scariest of try, all. <laughs> dude, dude, try the the muffin we have up here. We call him Prime Minister Unicorn up here. All right, let's go over to face. <laughs> let's go over to Facebook here and check this out. Lisa says the alien monster because even its blood can kill you. That thing was ugly. I could see where it was pissed off. It was just plain ugly. Don't you think? I think I, I think it was the most brilliant looking, you know. Look, the big problem with a lot of these movies is when you see the monster, you're depressed. Like, even me in episode 50, I hated the fact that they showed the demon. I never wanted that, but, you know, they wanted to pull the CGI. Alien is one of those movies that when you see the alien, it lives, every, it lives up to everything it, it's cranked. It was cranked up to be. That's why it's such a classic. Let's go to another one here. Regan McDon McNeil or Regan McNeil. You know why? That scary little zombie girl. <sighs> scary. She never scared me. All right. Never scared me. Well, that's because never you're into me. this. You're into this. See, somebody like me, I, I, you know, there may be stains. There may did be I stains. You, did I ever tell you what happened with that movie? No, go ahead. I, my parents want. I was. I, I think I was like five years old. My parents wanted to take me to see Charlotte's Web, and I started screaming and crying. I didn't want to see Charlotte's Web. I wanted to see Exorcist. So my parents took me in <clears> at five <throat> years old and went to see The Exorcist, and I laughed all the way through it. I loved it. I loved it. Every time I had food in my mouth, I was spitting it up. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> I wanted to turn my head around. I just loved it. I loved it all the way through it. So, mm. And I don't think to this day I've seen Charlotte's Web. <laughs> I think I was born, I was born under a right. bad sign. You, you, well, it's your, it's your, the way you were brought. Karai says, uh, just the imagery terrifies me and the voice and the thought. I don't even know why it horrifies me so, to be honest, but man, does it ever. Tanya states, I would have to go with Dracula because the story has it all. Drama, romance, tragedy, suspense. Frankenstein was a close second. I'm going to steam through some of these because we only got about three and a half minutes. Matthew, wow. Jareth the Goblin King. He would hypnotize people with his tights 
and massive package. <laughs> oh, this, this, uh, that's, you know what? That's what I get for reading these cold, Ian. That's what I get for reading these cold. <laughs> Pat says, Hannibal Lecter, because he is a sociopath who blends in but will eat you eat your balls as an amusement you know <laughs> uh, hey my man pinhead got one from sandra jason Voorhees comes to mind i wonder how he would have played hockey how good he would have been you know got the goldie mask on what's your thoughts on jason jason i think jason is the inner id of every nerd kid I mean, Jason was our hero. He was a kid that was picked on, rose up from being picked on, and killed all the popular kids, and then gets killed by the by the good dirty girl. That's that's he he took he was every nerdy kid's revenge on everyone that picked on them in high school. Well, you know what? I think you were absolutely correct in that. The reason why I wasn't a big fan of Jason Voorhees and the Friday the 13th movies is I got sick and tired of watching him walk through the forest, walking everywhere. In the meantime, you got these track stars or football stars who are running as fast as they can, and they always trip. And he's right there behind them. It just got absolutely boring to me because it was almost the same scene every time. All right. Snarky says, Robert England or Tom Savini. Michael, Boris Karloff. I have his death mask. It's a long but fascinating story. Ron wow, Ma- that one I'd like to hear. Ron Moniak. The Ukrainian watermelon waving hello from Saskatchewan. Where it's nice and flat and we can all see him. His one, the spawn of Satan, Justin Trudeau. Well, what about Svengali? Does anyone have Svengali? John Barrymore, Svengali? Oh, I still think Justin Trudeau is more dangerous. I really do. Than Svengali? <laughs> mm, try it. Come on up, Ian. We'll show you the ropes. <laughs> Bobby is like Dracula because he sucks. See what I did there? Coral. <laughs> Coral, Nosferatu. Somehow it seems scarier watching after midnight in a dark room while babysitting gave me nightmares. Predator. And then Bazooka Joe puts a gnome on a Oh, that's a your, that's your kryptonite. Very, very, very scary. Very scary. Ian, my friend. Hard to believe, Is it man. that time already? It's that time. Wow. My friend. I can't believe it. Quickly, big shout out to Death Metal. Go for it. You got one minute. Death Metal. When you when you hear it, you're cursed. Once you see it, you're scared to death. It'll be it's going to premiere in August at Gen Con in Indiana and then coming to a festival, eventually a theater near you. Ian Holt, and where, we'll can, keep people, you updated. where can people buy your book, the sequel to Dracula? Everywhere you can buy it at um, at Amazon. You can buy it. Barnes and Noble still in business. You can download it. You can do everything. At, uh, it's always at Amazon. I think it's on iBooks. So it's everywhere. You know. Um, also, fifties on iTunes on uh, on Netflix. It's it's um, it's everywhere. It's uh, on uh, Amazon. You can just watch it on Amazon. Um, and um, you know. Um, uh, Dr. Chopper as well is on is on Amazon. My friend, I got to put you on hold, but we will talk to you on Thursday, yes. May, May 24th. Pick your poison, Big buddy. Birthday show. It's the birthday show for Ian and Dave. Hold on, my friend. I got to wrap this up. We got Mr. Ron Bubblefoot Thaw rocking in the background with Little Brother is watching. Yes, the guitar god from Staten Island rocks us in and out of every single show. Get your horns up. For Mr. Ron Bubblefoot Thal and Little Brother is watching. Tomorrow night on the program, tomorrow night on the program, we have 
David Weatherly joining us. We're going to talk all things cryptid, weird, strange, black-eyed kids, and everything in between. 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern time at spacedoutradio.com. A big shout-out to everybody at home, in your cars, at work, wherever you may be. Especially to those on Twitter and hashtag Spaced Out Radio, in the Periscope chat room, in Spreaker, and a packed house in the Veterans Club on Facebook. Thank you so much for sharing this show, taking the time to spread the love, spread the word. You're doing great out there, space travelers, because together, my friends, we own the night. I will talk to you in 21 hours from now. Mr. Bumblefoot, we need a favor. We need you to take us home. Good night, everyone.